We don't need the campaign city. manager for the guy that's actually running for office, by God. <laughs> no. I don't want to be. All right, oh, check one, it. two. Check one, two. Here we go. Welcome to We Are Libertarians for this week. I am your host, Chris Spangle. To my right, as you heard on the last episode, uh, Greg Lenz joins us. Chris, how are you, buddy? I'm doing pretty well. And across the table from me is Jeremiah Morrell. Morrell? We'll go with Morrell today. All right. What and a treat it yeah. is to have old Jer back. I know. Henry County. We were in Henry County last night. We were. Indeed. We Su- were. Super secret planning mission. Well, we had to uh, lay a wreath upon his, uh, his statue there at the 4-H grounds in Henry County. One day I'm gonna actually take you out. There. You're gonna you're gonna have the time of your life. I can't wait till people uh, come up and be like, you know, Jeremiah Morrill. Any, anytime anybody from the wilds of of Indiana, from the rural country, says, "I'm gonna take you out there and you go live it," I get real nervous, Jeremiah. You should. <laughs> uh, so thank you for joining us uh, this week. We're gonna talk a little bit about. I, I don't even know. We haven't even really talked about what we're gonna. Well, talk about. I have. Right, I well. was actually prepared for it last week, and All then right. then Rob Kendall decided to have a bromance. Or, you know. Yeah, we need to talk about Rob. Oh god. That was. I listened to that episode. You guys published it Thursday, I think. Yeah. Uh-huh. Thursday, and I, I I had a busy day. I turned it on. I listened, and I couldn't turn it off. I was. 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning listening to you guys. Were you really? I really was. Riveting. Wow. It, was a, it was one of the best episodes that I wasn't on in a long time. Now, it was I heard, great. I heard from a few people how much they liked it. Really? I mean, I love having Rob on because I love how much you love to give him a hard time. I also heard how many people absolutely hated that episode because I turned into a libertarian podcast and you guys are defending Donald Trump. I'm like, listen, bro. I, I, I said, told the guy on Twitter, I was like, I have nothing to do with that. I disagree vehemently with Rob and Greg yeah. on Donald Trump. I think he's terrible. Well, We're on the side of Walter Block. You're, I don't know who you're with. We had, we had the insight. <laughs> the side the... of principles and liberty. <laughs> he wrote the book Defending the Independence. Listen, let me tell you something, Greg Lindsay. You better not rustle me right I now. I know. I'm I have dirt on you. Oh, no. oh, you have dirt on I've tried to be uh-huh. respectful. Okay. Well, that I... took a minute and a half. It did. <laughs> Uh, no, I, going back to last week's episode for you, before you go too far off into the ditch here, yeah. the leader, the, uh, it was really neat to listen to the inside Republican baseball talking about the impact that this show and you guys have made. Yeah. And the meme team that, uh, that Greg Lentz is. <laughs> the meme boys. And, yeah, and, you know, getting the next senator from Indiana, potentially, to, to, to uh, use force against our, our he dear did, man. He tried to intimidate me. That's, uh... That is not what you'd expect out of a Marine. No, because he's only 5'9". I could have just picked him up and thrown him around. And then uh, Greg took out a Sharpie and drew a meme right on his face. I did. I IRL <laughs> memed him. <laughs> Hitler mustache yes. right, on the, right on the lips. There. Did he uh, look like this? No. Oh, no. <laughs> that looks like Confederate Hitler. Yep, that's little Brett Bittner. <laughs> oh, man. Brett made me write. We wrote out uh, So we wrote out to a Rex Bell for governor planning meeting. Rex is running for governor against Mike Pence and John Gregg here in Indiana. And I rode with Brett Bittner. I get in his car. Uh, everything's on military time because wouldn't you figure a little Brett Bittner would be on military time? He is punctual. Yes. And then he was like, so, do you guys want to listen to Hamilton? I was like, what's Hamilton? He goes, it's a musical. I was like, <laughs> can you just steer it right off the interstate into that ditch for me? Well, he was a ballerina for like a long time. Really? Yeah. His sister like was a professional dancer and like. I well, I know that. He's, no, he was one trained. Trained. He's classically trained. Yeah. So you're telling me that Brett Bittner was a was a professional dancer, ballerino, not professional, but like, you know, ago, like how yeah. you take like uh, uh, piano lessons and you never like get into Juilliard, but like you did it and you become pretty solid. You know, like Chloe does is her talent for uh, Miss Indiana. Professional dancing. That's not professional when you. <laughs> Chloe. Brett Brett would not win amateur hour at the ballerina strip club. Chloe, he's stripping at his own pace. Did you put Little Bittner in the corner? I can just see us throwing pennies at Brett while he's dancing. <laughs> not one dollar bill. It's just earn it. pennies. Oh, earn it. If any of us ever worked at a strip club, it would be, oh, there would be, A, it'd be the best attended amateur night of all time. And B, I can't imagine the photographs that would be taken and posted to me if I were on stage. Oh. A comedy club. In the spring. Yes. By, by September, we're going to be down on the southeast side at the... Uh, uh, classy at, Chassis? At the Classy Chassis. All right. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, look, there's my uh, hi, kid. Yeah. Uh, yeah you've got to, I don't want to interrupt, Chris, but you have a feline walking across your board, and I know that's delicate. Yeah, she's... It's, she, listen, my board is very big. 
I have a very big board, unlike Rob Kendall. You've got you've got so many inputs over there. <laughs> I've got eight inputs. Rob only has four. He's half the he's half the man I am. He has half the board you do. I know. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I was listening back. My favorite line is that uh, I think you're obsessed with my girlfriend. I think your girlfriend's obsessed with me. I was like, oh, I'm so funny. Oh man, look at me go. <laughs> <laughs> I liked that it got to some raw emotion in that element because I was, there was I don't listen to struck. I don't listen to many past episodes, but I couldn't wait to hear that cringeworthy moment and <laughs> see if I could detect any real butt hurt and between me or him. You and both of because yeah. you were butt hurt because you thought he thought you actually would uh, try to cuck him. Uh, and then I mean, there's no doubt that I could, but I wouldn't because <laughs> I'm listen. I'm a man of honor, and I would never foul any woman that he was dating. I painted <laughs> oh. but just yeah. as it's currently happening, it, you reserve all resources in the future. Listen, as long as you get permission, right, Greg? <laughs> I don't know why I keep being drug into this. Oh, you just wait. Oh yeah. Uh, what do you want, mittens? Get out of here. Um, what? Were we, oh yes. Uh, but I had not yet listened to the Donald Trump interview. Okay, all right. Mittens is getting the hell out of here. I, I said she Donald said Trump. I said Trump, and she beat it, man. She was she, out of here. Just, Apparently, she's got some Mexican in her. She yeah. had to go right over the wall. She could climb the wall. So there's no doubt she can do a standing six foot jump. You make that foot, make that a six foot high wall. She's out of here. <laughs> I I had not yet listened to the Trump interview when uh, <laughs> when I posted it. I finally sat down and listened to it. But I was like, if we're gonna put this in the feed. And thousands of people are going to hear it. I might as well listen to it first. Absolutely professional. I have never, I have never heard a ball licking like that. I mean, that was literally audio filleting. The next, you know, form. Goebbels would have sat there and cringed hearing something so. I don't think. I don't think Kim Jong Un gets the same treatment in North Korea by their media. It was. It was stunning. It was so. Unbelievable. I mean, he, I Mr. Trump, thank you for saving us. I'd like to start this interview with. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, Mr. Trump, you are so wonderful. You, you, you li- oh my God, then look at the size of that. Mr. Trump, you go, you, you can tell you love every state that you visit. Mr. Trump, you could do anything you wanted. You're the, just the greatest at everything you choose to do. You're incredible. And at the end, he's like, uh, gee, I wish all the media were like this. Yeah, because you're a uh, uh, dictator like, what is that? T word, totalitarian, totalitarian jerk off, and I don't the, think that's the formal term. And this is your little your little Goebbels here, you know, saying, uh, ah, it's it's I'm the, apoplectic. It's the media Mike Pence wanted to create yeah. last year. Oh my God, yeah. It's it's what it is. It's it's the staff journalism that's going to write press releases and interviews. It's ten minutes of ball washing, and I don't mean the kind on the golf golf course. <laughs> I mean it is unbelievable. You have to listen to it. Because I couldn't, I couldn't determine if it was Borat-like performance art, and he was doing the Trump character to Trump to see if he would kick him out of the room or love it, which of course he loved uh, a copy of himself talking to himself. Or I think it was sincere, Chris. I do too, because the first couple times he came on here, he was like, I was offended at how nice he was to me and how complimentary he was to me. Like the first time he came on the the show report, he uh, he was on there, and then the first time he was on, he was like, "You are just the best. You are so great, Chris. You are just the best." Rob's like, the best guy, though. I'm like, like he's a really don't nice you guy. S- sit there and say that to my face. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm in the Libertarian Party. We talk shit about each other. You're That's not, what we do. You're not supposed to be <laughs> yeah. nice to me. If you want yeah. to be my friend, you have to talk shit. Yeah. <laughs> You were the first episode that had it, but they're Hammer and Nigel. He did Hammer and Nigel uh, sometime this week too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was uh, it was a similar story. Yeah, and this one was much better. Though. It was an easier listen on the Weird Little. <laughs> yeah, well, we're course. supposed to be on Central Indiana today. His sh- Rob show uh, early next week, maybe. I think so. Yeah. At some point, as long as Ted Danson doesn't take your spots, I suppose, right? Well, actually, we're going to be discussing the Libertarian Convention, I believe, and Rex Bell's uh, candidacy. So you know, you might want to uh, give us some talking points, or you can just let me run with it. Oh, I yeah. Know. 
I think we trust you completely, Greg, all right. in, all, in all of the uh, the image for this. I will, That's uh, not what you told me in private <clears throat> league. No. no. no Are you just... saying that, that, that I am not earned the trust of the legend of Henry County? You have of me, but of him, he's like, let me approve those memes. Oh, oh yeah. That's because that's because of Rick. Everyone has Everybody to Everybody has to approve their own yeah. stuff. I would it's... never put something out without it, getting it approved unless it was Spangle. As much fun as I have with you guys, it, you know, we do take the, the campaign for Rex very seriously, and I've kind of stepped into the role of Keeping the trains on time as a cam- cam- campaign manager and whatnot. He was working camp- with Rex. And he was I, campaign I, manager raped. Right. <laughs> yeah. When you took the lead, I was like, well, that was a stupid decision. Yeah. I guess I'll There goes it. his social life, his friendships, his sanity. Yeah, I've just... Uh, his HTML knowledge that has skyrocketed. Yeah, I've have, I have learned more about uh, web interfaces and systems and everything else in the last two days than I cared to know, need to know. Yeah, they're not arguing about policy positions. They're not arguing about fundraising letters. They're arguing about what the web sh- website should look like. Which libertarians? Yeah. Which oh. content management system? We're gonna stay on track, and we are going to run the greatest libertarian campaign. Mandatory freedom. Mandatory freedom. Top down, uh, centrally planned free time. freedom. I'm just petting mittens with, with my with Rex Bell cat scratcher. That's right. That's a cat scratcher. Uh, those, I think, alone were good for ten or twenty votes at the convention. Easily, yeah. Oh, look at the look at the way she loves it. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That oh. is an endorsement right there. That for feels a good right for on her butt. You know, Spangle's pussy does get natty. <laughs> you got to really comb it out. So, well, I, I, it's my first time. <clears> He's playing a dangerous since, game, isn't he? Since the. I, He's playing a dangerous it, game. It's with me. high risk. He's daring me. It is high risk. This He's... is the first time since the convention look at, look that we've been able to get together and uh, and talk. And look at I, how I was very very happy with the results. Obviously, being being on Team Rex. Yeah. And, uh, Actually, orchestrating the entire thing. Yep. It worked out. Uh, it worked out well. But uh, I I do want to commend Jim and his people too. Jim Wallace's yes. group. They uh, they they did a very good job. And uh, and Jim was there throughout the entire convention. Has continued to. Uh, Continued to stay a part of the uh, of the libertarian movement, which uh, we're very happy about. And, Absolutely, and, and he's look a, forward to him contributing to the party going forward. What is? Uh, I know he's taken on some new roles. What's his uh, role going forward going to be? Any idea? I haven't heard of a specific role for him yet. Okay. Uh, you know, like anybody, you know, in November when you finish the campaign, or if you go through a, a you know a primary or a, a libertarian nomination <laughs> process and it doesn't go your way. Everybody wants to take a little bit of a break and reset and oh. figure out what you're doing next. Cause Even is, if you win. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, we've had more excitement from people. You know, Rex and myself and the people that are working on his group going into the convention. You get to that point and you are just, you've been working very hard to get through that and get your message out, doing events. And, you know, you've been traveling the state all over the place. And then you win. And then all the people come out of nowhere. And you're like, I've been going nonstop for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever it is. Yeah. And then you don't get a break. You have just yeah. events. It's been, it is. It's, it's been unbelievable the schedule we've had, and I, hopefully it's like that across the country. But I know it has been here in Central Indiana where we're raised. When I was uh, executive director, you you go to the the convention, and you have all these candidates who are, are signed up. Like they're just beginning, and you're like crashing at the finish line of putting on a convention for 150 people. And then they're all ready to go. It's so like the one day, that that Sunday, that Monday, the one day where you're just like, I need to sleep all day is the day that your phone is ringing off the hook and that it's just, yeah, you don't get a break. Like politics is, politics is the people business. So there's a lot of communication and talking to people. And and if you're not good with people, if you're not energized by people, then it, it, it can be pretty rough. Well, you need to strike when the iron's hot. I mean, we had we raised a bunch of money for a libertarian campaign. We raised a bunch of money in that first three or four or five days after after the convention, and that's that's what you have to do when you go when you have a peak or there's an issue that hits. You know, if you're working from the political side of this, it is that's the time you go and you you make it happen. And now we're into the point where we're doing the planning and the processing and getting into the into the stretch for the summer for volunteers and doing the rest of the flushing the rest out of the, the yeah. campaign strategy. Exactly. Yeah, because in a campaign, especially like at a statewide level, especially if you're a libertarian, uh, here in Indiana, you're in the the televised debates. Um, as a the media formed, it's the Indiana Debate Commission, and because we we're automatically on the ballot here, they put us in there. Um, but as a libertarian candidate, you get. The day after the convention, you get the televised debates, and you get the two weeks before election day. And like those are the three times that anybody cares about your existence. 
you know that. <laughs> so, so you just gotta ride that cresting wave when yeah. you can actually, you know, capture somebody's attention. That's exactly it. right. That's it. And uh, hopefully we'll find some ways to uh, create some more media for ourselves along the way. But uh, you just gotta drop nukes into the ocean and then watch as the waves go high. That's that's what I recommend. <laughs> um, Maybe that may not that might not work. That might be a bad idea. Well, Lake Michigan's not Indiana based, but or make, they may be Lake Michigan will be not the Atlantic or the Pacific, but uh, yeah, we'll just drop some nukes into the into Lake uh, yes. Lake Michigan. Let's be the first ever libertarian state party to announce a platform of forceful annexation of the neighbor to our north for water access. I like it. Alpha. Our, well, I want to thank a couple people. Our good friend uh, Tiny of the Obsessive Viewer podcast. Anthony, yes, the Obsessive Viewer yeah. podcast. Uh, it, I, I, it, well, it's it's Alex his brother. Yeah. We're, all right. So Alex is a donor to the Libertarian. Good buddy of mine. To, to we're Libertarians. Um, still waiting on uh, Tiny to, to pony up. But uh, do the Obsessive Viewer podcast. He, well, he came out to the live show. Yeah. Which, again, we're going to have one on May 23rd. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we want to thank Alex. want to thank Nick. Uh, last name withheld out of shame. And uh, Jason Doolittle for uh, signing up to be contributors. If you donate at wearelibertarians.com, you can sign up to do a uh, per show. So we get rewarded when uh, we do the work. It's very libertarian of us through Patreon. You can also sign up, uh, do a monthly pledge. You can sign up for seven bucks a month and join what, Jeremiah? The Jeremiah Moral Pizza Society. Right. Where is the pizza, by the way? I uh, I think we've had a, a, a foobar moment. Uh, I, I sent my contribution in. And I thought that was going to buy me pizza the next time I guess so. <laughs> you would think that. But, uh, Is this pizza washing instead of money, money laundering? I, you know, I, I send in $7. You'd think once in a while you could get a damn pizza. But apparently, well, what, that's not the way this works. No. It goes to ads and Facebook. Clubs. I actually was going to bring you a pizza, Facebook but clubs. you had dinner before. Because when I saw that you were having dinner before, I was like, if I'm not going to go get uh, Giacomo's Slaughterhouse 5 if he's not going to eat it. <laughs> you know, or he's not going to want it because nobody wants that after they've already had dinner because it's like yeah. the heaviest pizza ever. Joke's on him. He went to see Evan McMahon and did not get anything. Yeah, imagine that, Evan. Evan oh, you didn't have dinner? Oh, no, I have not eaten yet. No. I, oh, I, I'm so sorry. Crank, this is cranky, Jeremiah. I have some chips and salsa in there. No, we're all right. All right. Joe's some, back I, there? Oh. <laughs> Joe Ruiz, your good friend. <laughs> but no, we have taken your contribution and we have applied it to Facebook to... To do several things, grow our likes. We're up like 300 in the last week. Uh, we're we're skyrocketing on Facebook. We've added you know several hundred people over the last two or three months to uh, the subscription of the podcast. Have you guys passed uh, This American Life yet? On, yes. On, on iTunes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's I know it's coming. That day is coming. It, it on on Mexican iTunes. Okay, but not. American iTunes. <laughs> Going day, back iTunes. Right. <laughs> Gary Johnson's New Mexican iTunes. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, but in the Libertarian, uh, there are no rankings, but I am sure that we are number one in Libertarian podcast. Well, there's, it's hard to compare us to anybody else. Like, Tom Woods is, you know, interview-based and, you know, pretty policy-based. and then There is no other show like this. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I spend a ridiculous amount of time in the, you know, on in the, the road. car, on the road. And I listen to a lot of podcasts. This is the only one I'm on. But yeah. the uh, there's nothing else like this show. It's, it, it's a great blend of comedy, of policy, of politics, and just hanging around with your friends. Yeah. And I, uh, whether I'm here in person or Give I'm him listening, a $7 back. it's the same thing. <laughs> I'm getting on Donato's dog. No, no, no. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I am taking his $7, cutting out his, his uh, endorsement, and then putting seven dollars worth of ads on that SoundCloud post. Gotcha. So okay. it's a, we're driving we're driving uh, numbers here, but yeah, we have we have a very special show as we have been told by so many of you, and we want more people to know about it. So we need you to do a few things. Donate, so then we can uh, we'll just put the money towards promoting the message as we see fit and, and growing this thing. You can share episodes or the website on your Facebook page. If you want to teach a friend about libertarianism, then go to wearelibertarians.com, look at the path to libertarianism, uh, or you can check out uh, learn the, learn the Libertarian Movement button up at the top, and uh, you can find a guide to the liberty movement. Share those with your friends. So not only are we giving you an awesome podcast, we're also giving you the tools to convert your friends. Who will then no longer like you, and you'll right. have no one to share the podcast with. <laughs> it, no, it's fun to be, it's cool to be a libertarian. We, we are kind of like, the, we're right at the wave of like, we, we're sort of like the first Spider-Man when being a, a comic book nerd was, right. was all of a sudden cool because the movies were blockbusters. Yes. I, I have done this, Spangle's done this longer than I have, but I've been around the libertarian movement for about seven years now. 
I attended my seventh God, Indiana. You guys convention. are established. Yeah, ten years. Yeah, I'm wearing my establishment colors today. Wow. This shirt is black. We're we're in it. I'm like sixty days but, in. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. already want, they want you out. <laughs> I don't think they ever want to be in. <laughs> no, they're ready for. for yeah, they're going to have to re- rethink that. Send twenty five dollars and be a member. Who <laughs> asked me? I said Jeremiah. Are you sure? And you I, said Greg. I am, you said I, Greg. We're we going to need you. Better to have you, Greg. Oh no, boy. There's no doubt. I, 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 <laughs> we're effective and inclusive, right? All right. Yes, yep. we are. So anyway, the uh, <laughs> Spangle has Childish. taken Spangle has taken a uh, a souvenir, a scalp. I, I found I found something at the LP convention, and it is hanging proudly on his on his wall of trophies. He yeah. has a signed David Letterman picture. Uh-huh. He has multiple awards from the Libertarian Party of Indiana. He's got his Wayne Allen root. <laughs> hat from the uh, from the w- the We Are Libertarians show. live show. Yeah. He's got his asshole merit badge. He's got a signed Rupert sign, and he has the scalp that he took at the Libertarian Party of Indiana convention this year. Listen to him. Jeff is a dick, and so he left his name tag, and I took it, and it hangs on my wall of trophies. And I'm happy to not have you. <clears throat> so anyway, what I was saying before we got off on this tangent. Is we've attracted a lot of new people, <laughs> and uh, many new scalps. Many I've, done, new scalps. I've done this for seven years, and it has been a tidal wave of excitement from people. Yeah, and it's coming from a lot of different areas. It's coming from we're libertarians. It's coming from people that are just tired of Trump and the politics as usual, and, and Hillary, pe- and awful, Hillary, awful, awful. And, mm-hmm. and people that have lurked. And you've added Facebook friends, and you've grown your circles, and people have seen, well, this Jeremiah guy or this Greg guy, he talks about stuff that actually does make sense. And people have come in the last six weeks out of the woodwork and gotten yeah. involved. We had more volunteer requests. I have been working to affiliate counties around the state of Indiana. I've got first-time candidates running for Congress. I've literally been busy three or four nights a week because the libertarianism. We are seeing a change and a tidal wave has hit. And it's, it's, I, I want people to take away from this episode, my portion at least, that you've been in the wilderness for a long time. But people are paying attention now. Yeah, and I mean, listen, libertarian guys get all the hottest chicks, right, Greg? No doubt. So you have, you have. Well, an how did we go from? How did we go from the cresting peak and the momentum of libertarianism and everything on the, you know, this, all this excitement and momentum that we have to this? We got to what people care about. No, we didn't. Which is women, no. right? Right, Greg? Uh. Uh-huh. Wine, women, and song. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I joined the party... I Before be- it was cool? I became a libertarian because of Ron Paul in 08. I thought you became a libertarian because they paid you to be a libertarian. That's, that's kind of what I thought, too. Right. No. Um, I, I, started, I started making fun of Ron Paul in 2007. <laughs> I did, too. I thought he was going to get us killed. I was a Huckabee guy. Right, I legitimately watched the, debate, the presidential debates that year and thought, Ron Paul is literally going to get us killed. His foreign policy is going to lead to our, our, our untimely death. Somewhere in the archives, and maybe if I get some time, I will take that and add it to the end of this episode, I was on WXNT in 07, 08, making fun of Ron Paul. So I'll, I'll see if I can't dig that up. But I, I, the last bit for me that was... Uh, the domino that finally fell for me was the foreign policy aspect, thanks to Ron Paul, and so I became I, I became aware of the Libertarian Party because of um, Andy Horning. Yep. Uh, I, you know, Andy Horning named me a Libertarian. We'll talk to Andy here coming up soon. Uh, I, I just realized <laughs> that my my Rush Limbaugh talking points no longer made any sense because. Abdul just obliterated all that, and I was politically homeless, and then I found the Libertarian Party. And I kept looking around saying, why is the Libertarian Party not functional? (laughs) And it was because there wasn't a hired executive director, and there weren't enough people volunteering, and so... Party of should. Exactly right. Everybody thinks the Libertarian Party should do something, they ought to do something, but nobody ever wants to actually get in and do something. Or they do, and they get burned out because they just keep taking on thing after thing after thing and just never get any thanks. Yeah, other than like an election day uh, or a convention day, the busiest day when I was executive director of the Libertarian Party was the day after McCain lost in 2008. Uh, we had never had any, we had never had that many phone calls and, and information requests like we had that day. Uh, and then, you know, then people in 2012 felt like, yeah, I'm sort of with you, but we need to stop uh, another Obama term. 
And I feel like we're at that moment. So now, once with the election of Trump, we're now back to that same sort of momentum that got funneled into starting the Tea Party in 2009, 2010. You know, that, the, the loss of McCain, okay, I, I gave the establishment a chance. Their guy lost in McCain. So now we're, we've got Obama. I'm going to go be pissed off in a Tea Party. And that has become ineffective because it is socially conservative. I, I just see that the actual emotion is different. So, like, the reaction mm-hmm. isn't a call to arms emotion like the Tea Party seem to be. What I, from people I'm talking to, it's, I really don't think I'm even going to vote. I have no hope yeah. that it's going to change, and I'm going to sit it out. Which, I mean, I hate it that that's the case, but, because a lot of libertarians would say that's the ideal. Um, but... It, there isn't anyone unless you know we get our candidate out in front of enough people and he presents you know the libertarian message in a compelling way that inspires people and speaks to them at a personal level. We're going to look at record low turnout and the sort of a era of post Nixon crisis in American politics where it's yeah they're all crooked to hell with it after something like where Obama when he came in it was a Kennedy moment where it was yes go, yeah. yes we can we can create the world we want. But out of that Kennedy moment was formed the Libertarian Party. Barry Goldwater. A- A- Barry Goldwater was then Ron, the Ron Paul of then, and then it became the, you know, the uh, Libertarian Party. When Nixon took us off the gold standard, David Nolan said, ah, oh, the hell with this, and started the Libertarian Party nationally in 1972. Uh, you can look up, a, there's a video on YouTube, The History of the Libertarian Party, or Brian Doherty's Radicals for Capitalism is a great book about the history of the Libertarian Movement. Not just the party. The movement. The movement. I will say that, like, li- we, we, because I am a Libertarian Party person and, and have always been identified kind of like that's what I was known for when, and this started at the Libertarian Party, but we are Libertarians as nonpartisan. If you're a Democrat, if you're a Bernie bro, if you are a Republican, if you are not a voter at all. A Derek Michael Reed Libertarian. <laughs> welcome. <coughs> you, uh, we, we do not discriminate. Greg is a scumbag Republican most of the time. No, I'm a Libertarian Party member. You, I, you're stuck with me. Uh, I'm not locked in here with you. I you're keep, locked in here yeah, with I keep me. I'm trying to give you back. I know. Jared, you, you were around in 2012. Absolutely. You, you kind of came along in 2010 because you, how, how did you be, end up deciding, listen, I'm done with the GOP? <clears throat> I was, uh, and I, I've kind of, that, I've spent a lot of time thinking in the last couple of weeks about, about my evolution in libertarianism because I, you know, I took the world's smallest political quiz and man, I was not at 100 100. I was like a 70 80 guy. Oh, I would, go back. I was, I, I was, I was a pretty well there, but I was like, man, I don't know if we need to totally legalize all drugs and. You know, yeah, we should cut we should cut cut spending on the government, but you know, we probably you know what I don't remember what the questions were, but there was I was some moderation. I was not a yes, absolutely, and now I'm you know ninety hundred hundred hundred. That's where I'm at, and I understand it. But I you know I came along, at, and there was like this this crossover point where I had been the conservative Republican coming from the Mike Huckabee or you know the guy that just lost uh, lost the uh, Senate race here, uh, uh, Martin Stutzman. I was kind of in his camp when he was running for U.S. Senate six years ago. Um, and when he lost, uh, the Republican Party totally abandoned him. He ran for, he ran for that seat six years ago. The Republican they Party ate their own. realized he wasn't going to win. He couldn't win. They <clears throat> went to Virginia, recruited uh, former Senator Dan Coates, said, hey, come on back to Indiana for five minutes. We'll make you senator again. And uh, where where was I senator? Yeah, exactly. So old me. exactly. <laughs> I was a senator. <laughs> <laughs> what? And uh, yeah, and, and, and that's when I said, well, they, they this is really broken. There's there's no way in the world you can change anything from the inside. And I had been flirting around the edges, meeting some libertarians, and, and then I finally jumped in with both feet, and I haven't left. We are uh, establishment now. That's and it. so and when now, I, think, I hear you reflecting, what and, I actually hear is you crafting like and, you're a creation and, 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 and and establishment. It, it is the, it's what spawned me. Everybody's got right. their, their origin story, and that's mine. And now I just walk around in khaki pants and a black shirt. And, like uh, the establishment. And, and spread the message of uh, the Libertarian Party. You say, yeah, you know, son, when I joined. <laughs> when I joined. We had, <laughs> At the club. We had Microsoft DOS. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and an executive. Still don't have a database. <laughs> no. So in 2012, do you remember hearing Gary Johnson's name in the primary at yeah, all? I do. I, I, and I was, I was pretty well tuned in. So, and that's another thing I think Gary Johnson does have in his favor. 
I mean, Limbaugh was talking about him at that time. It, well, he, he stole the, Limbaugh's line. That's right. He My had, dogs he created had more shovel-ready jobs. shovel-ready jobs comment in uh, in New Hampshire, and Gary ran really hard in that race. Yeah. Uh, and he was, you know, with I, Ron I think, being in though, that yeah, just... it was it was the timing was not right. And it, in uh, 2008, they had uh, an event. Gary, that was the first time I really learned about Gary Johnson, this governor of New Mexico. He got written about and, in the American Conservative, like as the most interesting man in politics early on when he was still at the end of his governorship. Yeah, I don't remember if it was a if it was a Ron Paul event that they had at, in 2008 when Ron lost the nomination in 08. Yeah, it was they, restore the it was, was the restore the republic. It wasn't rally. a rally; it was a restore the republic yeah. rally. So Gary Johnson spoke at that, and that was the first time that Gary was on my radar uh, because I had followed Republican politics in 2008, and I still was one. So I, I kind of learned about a little bit about Gary then, and then I followed him in 2012. And then I was very excited when he dropped out of the Republican Party and, and joined us. And, you know, he, he did the right things, made the right steps, and now he's back again. And I, I really hope that he's been invigorated in the last couple of weeks. You know, it, as he's run this, this race, I, I don't think it's any surprise or any – he had some missteps on the front end. Uh, you I think know, he didn't – With the burkas and some other things where it just didn't – it, it wasn't the the race that we had all hoped for him to start with, but I think he's picking up steam. He was on national. He was on ABC, I think, Sunday with George Stephanopoulos. That that eleven percent number because that was yeah. an early poll, and I forget who was it. CNN PPP? or it, uh, Monmouth, I think. Monmouth poll C- was. CNN keeps pushing it, and it was yeah, it was a national Monmouth poll, and I don't think I know I didn't expect it. I expected six or seven, but to see eleven when it was certainly not. It wasn't absolutely clear Trump was going to be the Republican nominee at that point. It seemed actually the momentum, momentum seemed to be going the other way. Yeah. I expect that number to go to 16, 17. Well, the problem is they won't include him. <clears throat> we saw this. When Gary would be included in a, in a three-way race, he would get decent 10% numbers. And so in 2012, his campaign kind of bought into that. And I think they were a little crushed when they got 1% because they thought there's no way we're not going to hit five. But people, aren't, people weren't looking in that race. Right. They're, they are they, literally either I'm staying home or you, it, someone better woo me that actually has credentials. I was, go through the news cycle and the mainstream media is always opining, well, who's the third party candidate? Can there be a third party candidate? And there has to be a point where people figure out, they quit acting like, Paul Ryan's going to get in, or somebody, I, I don't know if it was a, a, yeah, Ted Cruz, Mitt Romney, I heard a, some, somebody on our local uh, ABC affiliate had, they mispronounced it, but Justin Amash, I, I, I guess. I, I heard he's courting the Libertarian Party. Well, I don't know. There's See, a rumor I heard that he's going to show up at the convention. Well, that would be an interesting convention. Yeah. I, I'm and, still going to be happy to be watching race cars for a, 500 miles. As much as I like Justin Amash, I mean, you really, I get tired of, as much as I like him. Republicans come in and say, "Well, your savior is here. You people are losers, and now you know, he's winners not here. like that. He is not. His but. people are like it, it's you know it's the, the staffers, the Liberty Bros that you just want to choke to death because they're the most arrogant, condescending sons of bitches on the planet. Right. That's the you know. But Justin Amash is as libertarian just about as it gets. But he is in a district where he exists. You know, he wants to affect change, so he does have to." you know, work within the framework of a government he, system. He fundamentally cannot win our convention because you cannot, you cannot, a delegate convention fight is so different than what people think of. I mean, it really is about personal relationships. And when you've got Austin Peterson, John McAfee, Daryl Perry, well, Gary McAfee's, Johnson. Well, they've been traveling around all of these state conventions and they've been meeting people. Right. And it's, it's as close to the New Hampshire primary process where you've met your candidate two or three times and mm-hmm. you've had a conversation and I, you know, I meet with these people that say, well, Gary's, Gary's off on this issue a little bit. But when I go to Orlando, I'm going to talk to him. We're going to get straight down. Right. <laughs> people really believe it. They know that they're going to get to talk to him and see him, and they're going to have their opportunity right. to voice that. Which I hate. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 do, I do worry that Gary's not going to get it because of those missteps. Because he, he I don't think he expected a tough race. I think... Everybody kind of wrote off Austin Peterson. Everybody wrote off John McAfee, and they proved to be stronger candidates than anybody realized, including the Johnson campaign. Well, they treated it like a real campaign. Right. All three guys treated it like a real campaign exactly. worthy of the American voter. And yeah. I think that speaks just awesome. mountains about I mean, the we, future I can't. I didn't know who Austin Peterson was. I, I wasn't involved with national-level liber- libertarianism. So he's just a young guy with a name for me when this started. That's where he started right. basically really? for me. Yeah, I, I was not aware of Austin. Oh, wow. I've been involved in the Libertarian Party of Indiana politics. I went to one national convention. So I've national level has always just been, you know, whatever. I've, I've been state and, and level down. Yeah, that makes sense. That's start. me. I'm an LPIN guy. Yeah. So I, you know, I by default, I started with Johnson. 
But I'll tell you what, yeah, if, if Austin, <laughs> if feeling Austin wins, feeling the Johnson, uh, which would really is not, not a helpful, <laughs> not a helpful slogan. No, if there's can, nothing for wrong those with of that. you that keep posting that meme, you're not helping the campaign. Right. So it's funny for us. Share it in your internal chats. Please don't post it when they actually talk about your candidate because right. it doesn't happen. Don't touch your Johnson. Don't feel the Johnson. Just leave the Johnson leave the out jo- of it. Leave the Johnson alone. Leave the Johnson out of it. Say, climb me like one of your African peaks. <laughs> you calm down, Mr. Trump. <laughs> All right. Yeah, anyway. Austin, was, Austin really, his interview with us was really good. He's done well. And I, I you know, I take the eye side with quiz with Austin, 97%. I know. I'm, I'm 93% with Gary. 92%. Well, Gary's 86 with Gary. Yeah. 87. Well, <laughs> you're impure. Yeah. yeah. No, Gary oh, took it for Gary's himself and didn't get 100. I thought he retook it and it, it improved. Well, he didn't know the, like, the drop down, oh, the additional. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, the uh, I, I've been very impressed with Austin Peterson and to the point that if Unfortunately, there, there's not a, there, there's so much more credibility with Johnson going forward and, and things for people to advocate for on his behalf that we've got an opportunity to, to do, actually do something big with Johnson. Right. For, for Peterson, it, it is going to be, hey, he's the youngest guy, and the founding fathers were real young, and he's right on the points. But I, Earn Media, it, Gary Johnson is the smart yeah. choice for us. It, it, he really is. But if Austin wins, the pure Jeremiah... It's all right. Okay. Austin is an unapologetic libertarian, and that's what I love. Because mm-hmm. there's two kinds of messengers. There's the one that tries to fit the message to sympathetic ears, and there's one that is just brazen, and I'm not going to apologize because I'm a libertarian. This is what I believe. This is right. You're wrong. And if you don't like it, get out. Yeah. And I, I, I just... I've been dying to hear it, and he does it actually well. Yeah. Now, you know? McAfee posting pictures of himself today in the Oval Office... It, that that's that's gone to the point where it's not credible for me. I, oh, and yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know what credible. the numbers are going to be, but you know, when he had his, the debate uh, with uh, with Stossel, he played the part and he looked reasonable enough. But he's your VP. Uh, un- <laughs> unfortunately, it's just I I personally couldn't do it, and I'm not sure he's going to have any coalition of delegates in, in Orlando to be able to pull it off. I will say that that Stossel debate really put a lot of eyes on these three campaigns. And Johnson was the front runner and the unquestionable a two time you know, governor. Right. Versus was, a meme guy and <laughs> a fugitive. Right. And and so it was never really credible. And then that race put a spotlight on all of them and you know, uh, Austin laid a very a very well laid out trap on the uh, gay cake baker stuff and uh, about gay cakes and man, that, he could do that in a real if you if I have to choose based on there is a th- the Libertarian candidate included in a national televised debate. I want Gary Johnson. So I don't even want him calling himself Libertarian. I want Austin up there yeah. going toe to toe with Donald Trump and just bashing him, and everyone will cheer. So we had we had a something happen. Personally, I think they here, will. But I think Gary can get in the debates. I don't know that they'll let Austin into the debates. You're right, but I'm saying That's, if it were all equal and we had access, like an Indiana with the governor's <laughs> debate, I want Austin going up there and saying, "You guys are both wrong," and everyone out here is saying it internally, and they just know that you're bullies, and they have to get in line. Right. So I know that as libertarians, we want to just cast off the mainstream media and all that, but they they are they're talking to Gary Johnson. They have his contacts from 2012. He did a ton of media in 2012, and so he's got those contacts. And all that is very important in a race. I mean, the, the presidents, your gubernatorial races, your Senate candidates, those are marketing races. And you've got to have somebody that can get their foot in the door. And, you know, can Austin get media being 35 years old? I don't know. I don't think so. Well, he's the reason there was a presidential debate, though. He, he, absolutely. The party owes an awful lot to Austin for that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe VP. Although, I don't know if uh, Judge Gray, it doesn't matter. It's inside baseball, yeah. but... Yeah, I, no, J- Judge Gray is not running. Alicia Dern has has announced. Yeah. I don't know who else, yeah. but it's a totally separate race. I nominate it's, Chris Spangle. Can I get a second? Uh, so nope. move. Nope. And oh, he's not old enough. He's that's this right. This is the one time Spangle's not old enough for something. Yeah. Normally, it's the you know, hey, I have a twenty year old girlfriend. Yeah, but you know, well, he's I'm not old, old enough to be president. Where are you? I'm at the liquor store getting her beer. I'm <laughs> <laughs> like a good libertarian. It's so true. Not on a Sunday. Uh, yeah, I, I just I think Gary Johnson to me is the guy that is going to get these interviews. He's already getting all the. I mean, he's getting more press right now in the primary than he did in the general in 2012. And we saw here in Indiana when we picked Rex Bell over Wallace, the media establishment went, 
Well, I guess they aren't serious about winning because they picked the they picked the party insider over the guy with a million dollars to spend on his campaign. You know, which so so it it puts Rex's campaign at a disadvantage because we did the opposite of what the media expects and I know that we don't want to, you know, well, it's all about party principle. It's like, no, once you get into politics and once you start talking about Republican Party, Libertarian Party, Democratic Party, you're leaving the realm of principle and you now have to have principles plus pragmatic politics. And be able to stand out. Yeah. Not be like, well, I'm also a Republican, but not all the way. So you, you do have <laughs> to think strategy. strategically what is going to be in the best interest. Gary Johnson, while I'm probably closer to Austin Peterson in principle, Gary Johnson may be the more pragmatic choice. And that's really what matters when we're talking about a political campaign. They're both, think of them as cars. They are both great cars sitting next yeah. to each other on the lot. One is a, is a 2015 Chevy Silverado, and the other one is a 2015 GMC Sierra. One might fit you just a little better, but they're both going to be just fine. Yeah. And I'm, I'm comfortable with either. And it's, it's race-specific. If this wasn't something where everyone in America was looking for an alternative, then I would say, you know what, Austin's going to be brash enough and yeah. you know, challenge the status quo. That He's more you know what, if this, fight and if this is a Michael the Badner year, then yeah, yeah. But if it's not, this is a year where they're literally pouring. I mean, there's a there's a Jeb Bush. All these guys signed a pledge saying they'd endorse the candidate. And After Donald Trump it. got crushed for that, and they're not going to do it, and they might run the flip, the flipping Mormon who just keeps losing. And, and He's so at Lie Stevenson of the why, Republican Party. Here's why I think that Gary Johnson is the smarter play than Austin. It's because this race is about getting disaffected Republicans and Democrats to vote Libertarian this time. And why do I want that to happen? Public money. Because it, every time you pay your taxes, if you pay your taxes, you can check mark a box that says, I'll give $3 to the presidential election what, campaign. What Libertarian has ever checked that box? Ever. Uh, we're going to spend Democrat money, let's be honest. But we want their money. Right. We're, gonna spend we're just getting it back. And so if he hits 5 if the, our nominee hits 5% in the presidential race, we get access to public financing. And so what that would have meant is Gary Johnson would have gone from a million or two in two, 2012. I think it was It's 80. like matching oh, it's dollars. Like, I think it's matching Oh, money. is that oh, really? what it is? Yeah, it's, it, I, I, for some reason. I, the rabbit holes I go down sometimes. But it's, it, you basically, to get the public financing, you have to show a broad coalition of money. So you've raised at least $100 oh, that's right. in this it state is. and it's that state upon, in certain places. Yeah, so with the formula. Yeah. yeah. So it, it would take some, some administration to do, but in our position, it's the best way for our party to multiply money. No doubt about it. There that's are so right. many libertarians and just not a ton of libertarian party members. Yeah. Right. And so once you hit that public financing in the presidential race, the race that everybody cares about and everybody can vote in because this presidential candidate, all whomever ballots. it may be, will be on all 50 ballots. Uh, and largely due to Gary Johnson's work over the last four years to ensure that he would be on all 50 ballots, he sued the presidential commission so he could get into the debates. I mean, Gary Johnson has done a tremendous amount of work and spent a tremendous amount of his own money trying to ensure that our nominee, no matter if whether it's him or not, will have the benefit of, of those two things. Um, you know, which I think, you know, as much as I like Austin and John, you know, they, they haven't been working in the party the last four years the way that Gary has. And so party loyalty does come into play when you're talking about... I mean, in uh, almost uh, every way, he's the perfect... I mean, he just... Yeah. You look at it, and you take away the just R, the L, and the D. Just and he's fine. Yeah. And so... Yeah. Once and that you... will come up at a moderated forum on... A, you know, it might if right. he was included, but they're not going to ask Trump and Hillary about that their perspective on the libertarian candidate's position. Well, no, it's that, it's that inside was, baseball. That was right. an answer that he was answering, like, listen, whatever I say here could be played on CNN a hundred million times between now and then. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play it safe, and even if it hurts me in the short term with libertarians, I have the confidence to pull it out. I don't want to lose a general by going on record and, and saying the most libertarian, you know, which speaks to your Austin point. It, it, you know, and Gary spent 30 minutes trying to explain his position from a very rational, it was very libertarian. He threw, he threw a wall of words trying to yeah. explain his position. He spread liberty with this enormous <laughs> block of text in eight point font, single spaced. So, but once, once we hit public financing, then you can springboard that into the 15% in polling to get into the presidential debates. That's and when our memes go to TV. That's right. Yes, we take we our, our memes will be cartoons. We will no They'll longer just be teams. a digital uh, messaging party. We will be a fully functioning media 
establishment party. Mean, mean. Uh, you laugh, but the Marlin thing, the puppet, yeah. like it's real. I know. So, so yeah, that's why I think that Gary, you you want a credible candidate that Republicans and Democrats are going to feel safe with. And that the media feels safe with, so that way we can get as much exposure now to build as much vote total as we can in November. And then, you know, if you give Austin Peterson four years from now that public financing, man, it's off to the races for this party. Is, did you did you guys uh, see the blog post this week? And I know that's a libertarian thing to ask, but the 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 rabbit hole that somebody went down of if. If Gary wins New Mexico and one more Western state, no other candidate gets to 270 and it gets thrown into the House of Representatives. I did read that. That was in a long... It's, and then the House of Representatives if had... You're, the, if you're like, a fan of West Wing, I think it's the kind yeah. of thing that you'd be into. But, I posted that in the uh, group. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. and it, But the thing was, it was on like a dot word pre, or a dot WordPress blog. I'm like, this is it's, fantastic it's, writing. It's, no it's not in the Washington Post yet. Yeah, it's not in the Washington Post. Yeah. But they published... I mean, that is my favorite of the big newspapers, but man, they... They give, like, um, you know, there's not a lot of intellectual thought leaders right now that are young on the left other than Ezra Klein and Matt Iglesias. And the Washington Post seems to just pick the absolute turds. Like, they just put forward the biggest party pundits on the left I've ever seen. Yeah, what, what's the woman that writes for the Post for the right side? Oh, uh, wait, for, oh, the, for the right? Yeah, I forget her name. Dana Milbank? No, not Dana Milbank. He's a guy. Are you sure? I for, uh, Jennifer Rubin. Jennifer Rubin, oh, yeah. The worst. How do you really feel? Uh, <laughs> she's terrible. You're a white male. Uh, Disgusting. Uh, no, I mean, President the, Underwood will take care of that. Yeah. Can you believe what's going on, though? Um, I mean, George Will is outright calling... The guy that it is Mr. the Republican. foundation of the intellectual right wing is basically saying, no, let's, let's vote for Hillary. He's wanting to tear the whole thing. Thomas Sowell's calling for... Thomas Sowell is a Reagan-era guy. I mean, he came up with William F. Buckley. He's the best... You know, he was a former Marxist and uh, liberation, black liberation theologist in Harlem. Go, you know, now he's... This is being, George Will? No, this is... Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he self-identifies. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, but Tom Sowell, who's out at the Hoover Institute at Stanford, an economist, and, you know, he's calling for... This is a guy who's very libertarian. Is calling... For a military coup if Donald Trump is elected president. No, let me tell you, uh, it's worse than Thomas Sowell and George Will, who have libertarian tendencies. My grandmother is almost 80. She lives in Florida. At she, least you still have a grandmother. She has... Yeah. has uh, Good genes over there, I'll tell quit you. Quit talking over me. <laughs> <laughs> I will banish you to the hinterlands. Um, my grandma is almost 80 years old. My grandma has multiple pictures that the RNC has sent to her of George W. Bush. My grandma, when she found out in 2008 that I started working for the Libertarian Party, didn't talk to me for six months. And finally, my dad made her say Merry Christmas to me on the phone. But she still, it was a year before she really would talk to me on a regular basis. I talked to her on Mother's Day. My grandmother is voting for the Libertarian Party because she hates Donald Trump so much. And I said... Aren't you proud of me now, Grandma? She's basically causing herself because we're going to cut Medicare and Granny's going back. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Ryan's commercials yeah. going to come true. Yeah, I'm going to vote for the guy that's going to cut off all my medication and surgery, and I'm going to, you know, basically die. That we just want to give Grandma the choice as to where she wants to go get her expensive I, I, insurance. I, I, I have Obama world. Uh, I have friends' parents, and they named their their dog George W. Bush. They're thinking about voting Libertarian this time. I mean, you fundraised George for Bush. W. Might vote for the Libertarian. He's not going to Cleveland. I know. Neither is George H. W. Is not going. No. Romney's not going. Jeb. I I don't Little know Jeb. if McCain's even going to have a job by the time they go. He's going to lose. I think he's struggling. But, I mean, you, you line up the Republican nominees for president in the last 20 years, and none of them are supporting this guy. Yeah. It's no. just basically Rob Kendall, Greg Lenz, and, and Bill down there at the, at he's the pulling apart. He's and, pulling and dead and even. Donald and, Trump. And he set all-time record votes in the Republican Party. Like, these are just true facts. Like, he set all-time record turnouts, more new entrants into the party, and no primary system. Um, he's pulling dead even in Ohio. He's pulling dead even in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Florida. in Florida, and I mean that's that's he, a new. There's a. It, he's either going to win and forge a brand new coalition, or he's going to lose. How that, many how many different places has he put into play though? Oh, he, uh, the the industrial the old industrial. <laughs> no, I'm saying 
how many red states has he put into play? None. I mean, he's going to be fine. He he's winning the evangelical vote. He calls it in Second the, Corinthians two, and he crushed Ted Cruz. I'm I'm just saying that when a party loyalist like my grandmother says to me, I never thought that I would find a candidate that would make Hillary Clinton look like a re- a reasonable president and an honest person. I've never seen any. I've, I've never seen an erosion like that in my life. Right, but the the establishment practical Republican is going to probably either not vote. Realistically, they're not going to have the enthusiasm to go vote. This will be the first time in their life they'll probably sit it out and hate that they did because of city. But you, but no, you cannot have an effective campaign when those people are not going to donate, when those people are not going to show up and vote for you, and they're actively the influencers. The way George W. Bush. If you watch the documentary, So Goes the Nation, it was about George W. Bush's miraculous win in 2004 and the campaign strategy that went around that. And, you know, part of their strategy was totally changing advertising to go to Lifetime and ESPN as opposed to CNN. Right. Because they said, hey, we need the soccer mom. Well, Carl Rove identified the biggest and most underrepresented voting bloc in American history, which was the once a work church attendee, and that's where they came up with compassionate uh, compassionate conservatism. Right. And so when you you have the influencers in a community trashing a candidate, you know, I mean, it's, listen, we, we all know Hillary. We all are familiar with Hillary. We all hate Hillary. That's why, eight, you know, eight years ago, it was the most horrendous thing on the planet to say uh, Barack Obama's a socialist. She's losing to a 75-year-old socialist. You He's know? not even a member of the Democratic Party. <laughs> right. People hate her so much. But he is a member of the tribe. I mean, you know, Zion's a powerful person. Right. Well, obviously. I'm just saying, I just don't... Well, I mean, like I don't tr- understand your optimism. So no, oh, I think I like I, I know we have different opinions on this, but I do think Donald Trump is going to win and surprise the hell out of people um, and forge a new Republican coalition of blue collar Democrats no. with um, non establishment Republicans. Is he going to be funded well enough? Because I, you know, he was able to get through and get the you know my buddy that's a welder, mm-hmm. that, you know, that that showed up and wanted to protect you know. The, the, the types of the issues that spoke to him. The person that wanted to make America great again, the, as opposed to you who preferred it wouldn't be. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, as, 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 as opposed to me who just wants to burn no, it down to nothing. Yeah. The, you just want to push but, Granny into a Florida, the Gulf of uh, Mexico. She's going to be in Lake Okeechobee by yeah. sundown. The, I, I can see him being able to win the primary votes and, and to get those guys to turn out for him. And, but it doesn't take that many people to run a primary. But they're just brand new. To That's get, the thing. Yeah, my mom never, but, had, but my mom had come. never voted in a primary, so my mom showed up in the primary to vote for Donald Trump. She's now voted for Gary Johnson after one Mother's Day with me. And that's the problem that your boy has. I, I just see it differently. I think Trump's going to win and everyone's going to lose their mind. But the, it the doesn't. he stays around and you get to know him, the more you get, he's right. going to grate on people. And the peop- you're going to lose grandma that was going to vote for, that was going to vote for any Republican, the stock Republican. She's going to stay home. And you don't know if the guy that turned out in the primary is actually going to come back and vote for him in, the, in November and be that excited. And I will say, yeah, he may forge a new Republican coalition, but when Donald Trump is gone, what is going to happen to that coalition? Because his It'll whole, be a mosh and but, Rand Paul and No, Nancy. but it, but he's anti-libertarian in so many different ways. No, but he's not a, this isn't a guy that's going to have a lasting in, philosophical impact on a, at a political vessel that hasn't had any kind of intellectual leadership in a long time. It's been bankrupt forever. Conservatism... Sure isn't necessarily what the Republican Party is. Conservatism is about the rate of change. It's about being cautious about not taking, you know, not all of a sudden taking cultural norms and all and just upending them and then creating a backlash. You know, Russell Kirk talked about what conservatism is, is that you look at everything that's around us today. You look at the institutions we have. It doesn't mean they're great. It means that this is what the smartest minds of a society in the past thought could best handle the situation they had at the time. doesn't mean it's still well fit to that time they were in, but it's the lasting um, impact and the lasting institutions and cultural norms of that era. Now, you need to be open to change because if you all of a sudden just, you know, it's like we talk about the worst thing for libertarianism is if all of a sudden we just, you know, ended the Fed. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, no one had any banknotes to go and buy milk. You know, they'd go to a strong man in no time promising free things. Um, I and so, rise. like that's that's what, like, and that's actually what I wanted to kind of talk about is like, you know, the Democratic Party has totally lost its way because it's not even like progressive anymore, and it's never really had the same thought leadership. The Republican Party 
originally was the party of Robert Taft. You know, Senator Bob Taft was a guy that was an old school conservative. Everything was about, hey, let's let's sl- slow this down for a minute. Should we go and start nation building? Should we invade Iraq when we were hit by, you know, Saudis? You know, that's the kind of conservatism and Nelson Rockefeller conservatism George we used to have. But he was a liberal. That's the thing people forget. George W. Bush increased, he created Medicare Part B. He had the tax cuts because he had to have something that was conservative. And then he had, and then he invaded and tried to nation build, which is arguably as liberal as you can be in foreign policy. Well, George W. before 9-11 was, was, was towing that line of what was an acceptable libertarian. But the longer he yeah. was in office, the more, you know, post 9-11, he turned into an authoritarian and he, he you know, Medicaid and, and, and it, it just went down. There were so many, and then the back end of his second term was just god awful. Oh yeah, and he with just the bailouts and everything else. But that that first year or so of George W. is 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 that original yeah. Republican that I could identify with. Right. Yeah. It's not someone that necessarily has fixed positions. It is someone that says, "Listen, let's not just go overturning everything and create a bunch of, you know, you know basically it's the the loud, angry, militant left. If we let them have their way." This is what you get is Donald Trump. If you change society too much from what people are not used to, and I saw someone, I know this sounds crazy, write it on 4chan. <laughs> no, he wrote about what happened, what has explained Donald Trump is that liberalism has been so antagonistic and so shoved down people's throats, eventually they you make, so, you create a majority who will, all of a sudden, they're not afraid anymore, and you're sitting there calling them every, you know, every ism. And they like it more because now they are in the majority, and you created that totalitarian. The state. pitchforks are out, and yeah. they're just coming. Well, that is that is what the brutal struggle lord James Neese teaches and preaches. He uh, talks about the fact that brutalists just at a certain point go safe spacers need to be told to shut up and grow up, and you, you know, there the world is a tough place, and by being sensitive to people's feelings, you only enable them. Instead of teaching them the realities of what life is, and you're never going to get through to a Bernie bro, you know they're so deeply ingrained in where they believe that they're not. You're not going to get a, a rational discussion or rational thought. So it's not even. Uh, you shouldn't even treat them with respect. Right. And I actually had a conversation on I'm this not, recently. I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm saying that's what the brutalist overlord James Neese believes. Well, he's the internet philosopher. Right. He's the Buddha of. Of the inter- interwebs. He's one of the OG 4 channels. He is. I mean, it's true. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That isn't just in the scientific realm. That's in, in every politics. realm. Right. It's in politics. You push, 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 make people feel bad, tell them that they're the reason everyone else has a bad life. And eventually, people just zone, they just tune you out and they say, all right, I don't care anymore. And now I've got enough people that agree with me. I can torture the hell out of you, and you can sit there and whine about a safe space until you cry yourself to death. And it doesn't matter what Trump's policies are, because it's just a it's He could just go shoot someone in the street, and he said it himself. Well, he, he, is an, he is a reaction. He is not a movement. He, it's like I said. I mean, he is. it's funny to see Ted Cruz burn in the grass fire that he helped light. I mean, he is that, that 2000... Uh, but he's also a Bush guy. Well, he's a Theodore. long, yeah, he's a long time guy who wanted just he just wanted power. But you know, it, he was part of that Tea Party crowd that are all up for re-election right now. Marco, Rand, Rand Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz, Mike Lee, yeah, uh, and he, there was a lot of anger, and well, and, yeah. it, and it was populist anger, and and there was a firewall in 2012 in the presidential election. Donald Trump burned that down. <laughs> well, that's he is he isn't a he's a cultural um, reaction. He is not a he's not a leader per se. He has no consistent pol- political philosophy. But the Republican Party hasn't. They haven't had that since Bob Taft. I, I would say that this election cycle, the the Christian conservatives just keep getting rejected. But rejected. that's not even a that's not a political philosophy. That was a forged coalition by like Buckley William F. Buckley created the new Republican Party. By forging together Roman Catholicism and you know the Christian right mm-hmm. with neoconservatives, and then Reagan supply side tax cutters, mm-hmm. and that's because the Republican Party under like Nelson Rockefeller and Bob Taft just kept getting killed because they couldn't distinguish themselves between the Democrats and all of FDR's things from the New Deal because they didn't have a vision forward. This is where the Party of No came from. It was well, well, let's hey, slow down. Slow down on all these new, the New Deal and liberalism and all these ideas right. of a progressive movement. 
but and, but they didn't ever pr- uh, present a compelling alternative. And right. so you end up with where we are today. No one has presented like a no, conservative no party of ideas. Yeah, I mean Reagan tells Chris Wallace's dad in his first interview, and you can watch it that what's at the heart of conservatism? Well, it's at libertarianism. This is in like 1978. You know, and that's the truth because you had people like Frank Meyer um, in the intellectual right. There's no one like that anymore. George Will issues commentary on things like, oh, you know, he, he flirts with libertarianism, but then when push comes to shove, he supports Hillary. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you've got Tucker Carlson, maybe. I mean, it's yeah, just, maybe. It, it's, it, there's, there, and this Stalson, is why I'm not a Republican. Right. I, there is nobody over there that I can look at and say, that, that's my guy. Amash, Massey, and Rand Paul are the only people that I can even remotely identify with. Yep. And that's it. And, and they're, so, not, and they're, they're the only they're ones. They're the absolute fringe of that party. They're yep. not embraced. They're not, they're, they are not. They have trouble fundraising. They get primaried every single Sunday. They won't fundraise because li- you know they're libertarians because they, none of them will go shake hands fun, and be a politician. They won't fundraise the way they do. They no, fundraise like, that feels calls. dirty. Yeah. This is awful. I have to look people in the eye. They don't go to the call center and <laughs> yeah. fundraise like they're supposed to. They're not good little Republicans. But, like, if you look at that, that's the only coalition that's identifiable anymore in the Republican Party. The neocons are dead. Yeah, the Liberty Caucus. Are, it was, yeah, the yeah. Liberty Caucus is the only thing left. Because Mike, Mike Pence and the Christian conservative Reagan kind of area, they all went and became governors. They're gone. I, I don't know about other states, but here in Indiana, all the Ron Paul Republicans joined the Libertarian Party in the last two weeks. Yep. So, yeah, I, don't, I don't know about the Liberty Caucus. So did uh, uh, Matlin. Mary uh, Matlin, Mary Matlin, yeah. yeah. James is, Carver, the yeah. Raging Cajun's wife. If you if you haven't listened to the interview with uh, Mary Matlin and Glenn Beck, you should go listen to it. It's probably on Glenn Beck's website. Uh, it was really interesting to hear why she did it, and she was surprised that so many people were surprised by her doing it. And Beck's just like, you're Mary Matlin. You've worked for two presidents. You've worked on more presidential campaigns. Like, you are a Republican establishment. Type. There isn't a Republican... Um, philosophy anymore no there's and so that's why trump's possible is because there isn't a a political party is used to identify recruit and train yeah people of similar similar interests in order to you know um put candidates forward educate fundraise and create social change it's all this it's organized around issues more than philosophy right and what's happened is it's not so much that like i'm not attached to vessel like if the Democratic Party all of a sudden adopted the Libertarian platform, oh, I'd be a Democrat. Yeah. Right. I have I have no loyalty to any name. Sure. You know, so realistically, I don't care what vessel it is, but what what happens in a society is that there's a breakdown in the existing governing frameworks. Mm-hmm. We're we're on a precipice. It, the, uh, democratic socialism doesn't really fit the American creation myth of the adventure. You know, casting off. We don't need. You know, we prefer adventure to security. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Republican Party, Ronald Reagan, the shining city on a hill, tax cuts and rugged individualism, whether or not we governed like that's one thing, but that's the image he sold voters. And that was the philosophy of the party. Right. Now it's, there isn't one on the right. All there is, is it just feels good to hit those whiny liberals. Yeah. And then on the left, it's, we look like Denmark. Yep. Yeah. And there isn't an existing framework other than the Libertarian Party to even find compromise in American politics today within the political institutions. And frankly, the Libertarian Party sucks. I'm going to say it. Uh, because we Not need the LPIN. No, well, sometimes. <laughs> we need to speak hard truths. Any party that has people in it has, has problems. I'm not saying it's... It's, a, it's interpersonal relationships. It's, and it happens with every organization you're a part of. It just feels more intense when there's not as many people to go talk. You can't go talk to a different crowd. No, or I, like I, someone else. To like there's only away. 97 people around here. We have to work together. Yeah, I hate that son of a bitch. And now I'm folding it. flyers. I'm not asshole. saying it's because I hate libertarians. I love libertarians. I'm saying that it is because... The Libertarian Party doesn't do data for a party of, you know, if you listen to our interviews with the with the two candidates for the national chairman, uh, Nick Starwark, which was a great interview, and Mark Rutherford, which was a great interview. I did those. Uh, they, <laughs> I was on one. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were there. I was just thinking about my questions and how great they were. Those were great questions. Thank you. He was, a, he was questions. a lot like Rob Kimball with Trump when he was talking to Sarwark. I know. I, I was like, it's, uh... Mark, you're so handsome. Uh, no, I, you know, what? the problem is that we have Razor's Edge, which is for something like the Harvard Business Foundation, where they have hundreds of alumni to, to fundraise, thousands of people to fundraise. You know, it's not a political grassroots data like we need, and the national and therefore the state parties don't have data. They don't manage, you know, they don't have a voter vault like the Republicans used to have. 
Uh, and secondly, I don't think libertarians make the case, uh, they don't make the case like Ronald Reagan made the case for a libertarian world. That's what I love about Austin. He is an unapologetic, and I don't care if you don't like it, I'm not going to fit my message so that you might give me two seconds to try to explain it. Right. You're not for me. Right. You're a, you're a progressive, and I don't care. Right. You yeah. Know, I, that, I, I, I'm sorry. Like That's the way I feel, because I never get to see someone present liberty well and strong. It is apologetic. You know, I'll try to fit it in here, and I'll be kind of goofy, and I'll put right. my neck down, and I'm like, why is no one's chin up and you know shoulders straight? Yeah, it goes back to confidence. We it have does. a problem with confidence in this party, and we're, everybody's afraid of bothering people. It's yeah. like, no, you need you need to get out there, and, and if we aren't confident leaders, if we are not going out there, not so much of what we do is talk about you know, the interpersonal aspect of, of how to live your life. I mean, it's half Oprah half the time in here. Because so many feels, so many feelings, Be, because people need to see that you are confident in your beliefs and your opinions. They want, they look for leadership. Right. They are. We're so desperate for leadership right now. Hillary Clinton isn't a leader. You, the people right. at this table, have authored the same number of legislation that she did in her term in Senate. That's exactly right. And so, and she also got a U.S. ambassador killed. There's nothing that says leader about her other than she got lucky and married Bill. Right. Like then there's Donald. Donald's co-opted at. A strain of anger and people clinging for one last shot at holding on to a cultural norm, I guess you could right. say, and they're angry about it. And then there's this wide open gap for someone to stand there and say, listen, this is what liberty is. This is how you live it, and let's do this. And look at these two morons. You don't want to vote for them. Right. But we don't even want to go negative. They both got coalition problems. Hillary's got a – she's stepped in and on coal. Her biggest group is going to vote – are now registered Republicans. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> she's, I mean, she, she basically said that she was going to shut down the coal industry and sorry about your job, so that's Pennsylvania, that's but I'll Ohio, do an apology West Virginia, tour. that's Evansville, Indiana. It's just yeah. going to be brutal for so many areas that she needs to win to try to stitch together. Their biggest that, voting block is blue-collar men. Yeah. And then, well, then white women, but, you know, if, if she doesn't win like 58% of white women, the thing's over. Yeah, it's it's they've both got they've both got a tough road. They're horrible candidates, but that's the state of American politics and the state of their parties. But unfortunately, forty percent of the votes automatically in their box because they just push the button when they show up anyway. It's straight ticket voting. Well, they have organizations that no matter what, and this is what I think the real key is. Part of the struggle of libertarianism is the decentralization of it. We decentralize power. We award power without earning it. We let everyone have a voice, and we're, we let everyone play because we don't want to be like that's the worst idea I've ever heard, and you're a moron. We're desperate. We're desperate for people to join. We so are. When they, when they join, we try to get and them volunteer and, and volunteer. And you know, they, what we we as a party don't have money. So what we have is we have a little bit of prestige. So we can make you a chairman, or we can get you on the ballot, or we can you know we can give it's you our a, a position. That's 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 the only tool we have. And those of us in the leadership try to spend time getting people trained and getting things going, but we all have lives, and you know, yeah, you're doing, you're have, working two to three uh, jobs all the time absolutely. as a libertarian. That's mm -hmm. why everyone gets there's burnout. You see, hell, we saw it with the last direct or uh, the last chairman. Yeah, the last two chairmen have gone through it, and I can guarantee you, when we get to November, I, I am going to be a just a. It's going to be rough. You won't want to see a libertarian I, ever I, again. I will be on libertarian hiatus for months. But see, that's why I do this, is I know that... And, and listeners, you complained about our infrequency sometimes, but that that's because I've been on hiatus. This <laughs> is like, as I've dealt with personal stuff. I mean, it's just very difficult to be involved in politics. Uh, and, and, and deal with the regular, like, you know, with changing right. careers and trying, you know, in your new job, you were trying to create something rather than just getting tasks handed to you. I later. have some breaking news. Uh-oh. Bernie Sanders has just won the West Virginia primary. Yeah. Feel the burn. Shocking. As we record this on uh, Wednesday, November, November. If they want to uh, win, uh, they should May run 10, Bernie Sanders because he will get the trade union vote and all these people that are blue collar trust him on that on trade because this election is going to be a lot about the TPP. Yeah. Hillary Clinton has authored it and through the Glint the Clinton Global Initiative carved out little, you know, things by campaign donations, little um, exemptions on things. Hell, it basically creates a brand new system of law for you know, for businesses that exist outside U.S. law. I mean, you can run on things like this, and that's why Donald Trump is taking her b biggest voting block. And pe people don't like it, and it, it's not a good thing because there's no intellectual philosophy behind it, a reason why. So yeah, I think it is, uh, earlier in the in the program I said, listen, once you get into politics, you do have to check principle at the door. How far? 
how far can you bend that? You have I mean, to. Your opinion. To me, if you don't, if you aren't backed by a philosophical position, because conservatism isn't really one. It's just the rate of change, right? Mm -hmm. And being careful about too, um, not too much overthrow. Whereas liberalism is rapid change in the name of justice. And so, you have to say you don't have to necessarily be like like. Um, Listen, it's all or nothing, because that's ineffective. But then the opposite's ineffective, because it leads to your demise, like what's right. happened now. So I think the point is that, where does the where does that line stop to me? I guess it stops that your platform has to be prioritized. So for instance, you have to have your, 50% of your message has to be, you know, the one thing that really caught a rising tide. 20% maybe... Um, like a secondary issue, like in this campaign, it's going to be about, shockingly, cultural preservation is going to be big, but no one's going to say it that way. Right. Um, and then next will be economy and protecting American workers. And then isolationism is going to be a big part of it. But see, that's the crazy thing. Like, somebody who is a cultural preservationist, like my grandmother, isn't going to vote for Donald she Trump. She doesn't see that's what's happening. Though. Right. Like, that's the, you know, what she sees is the, un, or like, you know, it's not civil. There's been like a complete collapse of. He's the, not presidential. There's and nothing she can't that get says past that. that. There, yeah. And yet, at the same time, there's no one more American that can, captures what being American is, or what he's Muhammad Ali in politics. Just a small loan of like a million dollars. I got but a, brashness. A, a, one of those pictures. You have your grandmother had one of, of George W. Yeah. I have my great grandfather's uh, signed one from Ronald Reagan. Really? Do you really? I do. I really do. That's cool. It's it's very cool. That's awesome. Wayne, and it's you know it's the it's the Ronald Reagan portrait. But nobody's going to want one of those from Donald. Your grandma doesn't want one from Donald Trump. No. He bought a She'll hat. She'll throw it away. And he hates him. I, it, that's a piece of Americana. That is an I like Ike bump, uh, uh, pin. I work, at a, I work at But a, when you're no longer around to tell the story, people will see that. I have... This is the man that has a Wayne Allen root for president. Uh, so, yeah. I saw the movie that got made about his betting operation with Matthew McConaughey and Al Pacino. I mean, look at that. The wall of liberty that, that stands behind you. As I, I went and on Mother's Day got uh, several tubs for my mom's house. Cleaned out everything but my newspaper and magazine collection of things like the Kennedy assassination, Challenger blowing up. I kept all that at my mom's house. I see, but, I see a Tom Carnegie bobblehead. That's all I can see. That's right. There. Uncle Sam, Barack Obama, Sam Adams... That Sam Adams bobblehead was given to me by a dear friend, the author of Spanking City Hall, Melissa Hubbard. Uh, you had one thing. Yeah, there was one there thing. There was one thing. But, oh, well, he hasn't gone there. But We're you, good. What, that she caused a... Stop it! <laughs> but it is, it's, you know, I collect political memorabilia and I have a whole shoebox full of buttons from Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents, Tea Party people that I'm going to put up on the wall back here, but, yeah, I mean, the, the hat, I work at a comedy show, A, so it's been handy a couple times. In theory. Yeah. <laughs> and B, it is, it's just, it's funny, and it is. It's a piece of political memorabilia. It's an icon. It perfectly captures the era of where you're in in American yeah. politics. Yeah. The, yeah. This Donald Trump campaign is one that they're going to remember and write about for 40 or 50 or 100 years. No, I keep trying to get us away from Donald Trump so I we know. can talk no, about what you're... It, but, but, like, no, that's the thing is, Donald, you have to set it up that way. Like, the two parties are dying. You know, the, the chair of the national LP talked about it. The Libertarian Party is the only one with growth, and it's right. doubled in the last 72 hours. It's the only party endorsed by, like, the ACLU on their civil rights stances and their consistency. Like, right. especially with Gary Johnson. Um... The, the, the difference between the Libertarian Party and the reason it's growing is two, it's two things. It's that the existing parties are no longer capable of governing in a way that people want to see change. It's led to an absolute breakdown because their positions aren't philosophically oriented. Right. They're coalition built and they're issue built. And now the issues are changing. And so no longer are they ever able to find middle ground. But there's one that is backed by a philosophical uh, you know, philosophical principles, and that's the Libertarian Party with, like, David Bowes, Principles right. of Libertarianism. And those are universal because it is that decentralization. It's the lowest common denominator, which is what something like the Bill of Rights is supposed to be. It's that no matter what, no matter what social, you know, what uh, social planner or academic has this great idea, this is what we're going to do to perfect society, libertarianism protects you against that no matter what because it always protects the individual. 
Right. That is the backstop, and that's why it's a framework that works in American politics. You can do a tax cut and pair it with decriminalization bill. Right. And get that change. It's the only party with a philosophical and governing framework that applies in American politics. How do we... Because it seems like so many libertarians are so long-winded. Me, I'm the king. I'm the president of your long-winded libertarians. I only speak in walls of text. Right. So how do we get it down to a Reagan-esque soundbite? How do we get it to a point where we are... It's the shining city on the hill, and we're moving people with speech. We need optimism. <laughs> we do. Yeah, we, we, need, we, we need, are so we, beaten down. We, we need to not act like we, you know we've been we've been in the wilderness like we talked about earlier. That it, it needs to be. We need the message in a way that's optimistic, and we yeah. talk about giving you control back, and and stop with the center planning, and, and get back to where you are in charge of your life, and you we sell a message of hope, and and your opportunity to make your future yeah. instead of the burden that we all have put on us. Just, you know, for me, it's always economic. So, you know, the personal freedoms are, are, are implied, but if, but we have to, to pay Gary them Johnson. lip service or we'll never win a big enough coalition. Exactly. But, see, but, but the, the Gary Johnson and the fair tax, that's so simple and easy to understand. And you've had Republicans, I don't know if Democrats have, but Republicans have run on that and embraced it. I still think the fair tax is a very simple and easy to understand thing where you tell somebody, you're going to get all of your paycheck. Yeah, but you understand, like you can look at an economics chart and make sense of it, an equilibrium price and supply and demand. The flat tax is so much easier. You're going to pay 10%. It's like tithing at church. But see, honestly, I just tuned out because I could care less right. what you're talking about. But you care about yeah. is, uh, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a Jill Stein libertarian. He's a Mother Earthitarian. No, I, I, so I had this conversation with Brett. I'm surprised he doesn't drive a Prius. Yeah, the state offenses, the state rape, and I know that's a brutal right. term, but like the state rape is what in, is you what offends you so much right. and triggers you to becoming almost anarchist. So, so but a tax cut to you is like, eh. Right, because it's it's just whatever. Like, So I was actually talking to Brad Lowry and Brett Bittner about this the other day and putting together a grand strategy to bring more Bernie people into the Libertarian Party because... You know, it's the dumbest mistake that we can make, and you get on me about the Trump people because they can be natural allies, and we should partner with those people. We should partner with everybody. We should really try, as libertarians, to be nonpartisan and to not, like, be... Like, Hillary Clinton is our natural enemy because Hillary Clinton is, if you take the I side with quiz, she's going to be in the 20s if you're a libertarian. You know, whereas Trump is at 69% for me. Bernie Sanders is at 68. Jill Sine is at 68. Ted Cruz is at 67 for me on my I side with, whereas Gary's 92. You know, uh, I hadn't hadn't taken it since they added Austin and all those guys. But, you know, when you look at where somebody like Brett Bittner came in or where Brad Lowry came in, like, Brad is a guy that is supporting Bernie Sanders, and we look at it and go, how can you possibly do that? You, as an eco you two as economic libertarians lose your mind. And I look at it and I go, yeah, Bernie Sanders is for criminal justice reform. Bernie Sanders is for drug re decriminalization. Bernie Sanders is for um, humble foreign policy. Sixty percent right. of Bernie, I I embrace, right. and I do get it, and I, I see why we're losing the people. But I'm also I'm always economic first. Yeah, I mean I I don't care. I just like good messaging. Like I just feel like we you know it's like I made we were talking about what you know you wanted to do long term in your career the other day. Mm -hmm. And Spangle said I was inspired by a libertarian marketer, and I about fell out of my chair. Yeah, like what? <laughs> there one was such a thing, you know, because we struggle with the bumper stickerism of our platform. Yeah, and it's for me. It's so we settled on gray and white, Liberty right. Chickens. <laughs> no, but it's don't it, get me started. <laughs> this is so easy to me because it's what do we really believe in? We believe in the individual controlling their life, right? right. The other way of putting that is local. What is more local than the individual? Yeah. So govern local. Things like that. Things like. You know, personal responsibility doesn't sell. You know what does? Pride. The pride of that. That's the byproduct. Personal responsibility, no one wants that. Because subsistence farming on your own homestead while you protect it with shotguns from your ANCAP neighbors is not that much of fun. Right. But what is fun is the pride that comes from self-ownership and walking tall because, you know, you earned it and no one can take it from you. Yeah. We just get so fixated on the features and 
you know, oh, well, is it better if we actually had a, a bond system so no one had to, you know, we didn't force people to join into the same cap society? You know, we get, we, we get lost. We lose it. Yeah, we get lost in the technocrat, it, you know, and the technical aspects because we are all so technical analytical. And, and analytical and we lose, and this is, uh, uh, listen, I'm an ENFJ. I'm an emotional creature. I Really? Yeah, I'm an emotional, I, I never thought I was an emotional person, but apparently I am. Uh, when my 20-year-old girlfriend the other day goes, you just love drama, shut up. I was like, me? <laughs> like, you are saying that to me? How dare you? Um, but I have no feels. <laughs> but it, it is, it, you know, I look at it and I, that's what he, uh, Mary Ruart's book, uh, Healing Our World, I think it is. You can get it at the Advocates bookstore, theadvocates.org. And it is, like, the first time I read it, I went, oh, this is what I've been looking for. You know, because I have spent so long in the land of INTJ technocrats that Mary Ruart's book was thirst for my emotion was was water for my thirsty emotional soul. Like it was the compassionate emotional argument for libertarianism, and I go, that's the kind of stuff we're missing. You know, don't tell me about tax cuts. I don't care. Tell me how much. Don't well, tell me about real. private. When private courts compete, we get better verdicts. Right. You know, like that. Yeah. Okay. I, when I get to Utopia, that'll be great. Right. Thank you. You want to torture me, strap me in a chair, and make me watch anything for the Mises Institute? I love those guys. Those guys are awesome. It's just not for me. I'm not that. I, There's I a Penn Jillette libertarian, yeah. and there is a David Friedman libertarian. Yeah. The David Friedman libertarian is going to love sci-fi. They're going to be the person that is oddly totally against anything collective in like where there's a social engineer but they're always engineering science types that want to build a perfect society yeah. and so they get fixated on like the the what was it the machinations of the state is mm -hmm. what he always says and how it's inevitable this system will step by step by step design into an or into a minarchy system right that isn't going to play but we need that but that's who we've promoted there are our thought leaders have come from the right on economics, and that has been a deterrent to anyone that sees someone struggling and doesn't want to say, "Well, that's their fault that they struggle." We yeah. shouldn't. I shouldn't have to pay for them because they made bad life decisions, mm -hmm. and that's prevented us from growing for so long because we just have had a you know a vacuum or a hollow voice on that left. Well, and that's that's where you know it, 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 our burden is to say. We have tried. The government has tried to fix it. They've tried to fix it. They've failed to fix it. It's not working. It's just like the drug reforms. I mean, yeah. You've got to just pull the plug and say, we. They, it, they can't do it. They've proven that they can't do it. Let's try the libertarian solution. They meant right. well, yeah. but the path to hell is paved with good intentions, and just leave it at that. Don't, yeah. you know, don't, you don't antagonize don't to, the people you're trying to bring in. Yeah, yeah you, don't have to, you don't have to piss in their Cheerios over it. Just... Admit defeat and let's try it differently, guys. Why don't we Together. do it? Yeah, why don't we do it where you, instead of a state agency picking the private uh, prison, the person in, you know the private private contractor, why isn't it a community board? Mm -hmm. Why isn't it community policing? Why isn't it you know even that's not ideal? It's closer it's a, it's to where it'll matter. In the correct direction. It yeah. forces. It feels like they're in control and it won't disengage them from the political process. So what what will happen if we get rid of? Uh, welfare, if we get rid of federal programs of assistance, we return to the townships. You know, in the township government in here in Indiana... Poor relief. Yeah, you go to the township government and you say, listen, I'm behind on my rent. I can't pay my rent. And, you know, uh, this one woman that spoke at a Young Americans for Liberty convention, she was in the West Lafayette uh, township up there, and she came in and she goes, I got 900 applications for poor relief last, last year. I fulfilled 200 of them because we go out, we walk in their apartment, you know, you walk in here, I, I'm clearly doing very well. This is a luxury you apartment. You are not getting any poor relief. Right? I get, You're going to have to sell one of your two soundboards before we can consider you, you for public you've financing. You've got a flat screen TV, you've got a nice car. A southern command, if you will. You've made bad choices with your finances and the taxpayers are not going to give you relief. Now, if we walk in here and you've got eight kids and, think, you know. And, it, and it's a case-by-case -case basis where neighbors are talking, neighbors going, okay, we've got this pot of money, we're going to buy your kids' school clothes, we're going to pay your electric bill, we're going to help pay this, we're going to help pay that. And we're going to get you through this very short term, and we're going to do it right. from the community level. Right. The human instinct is to help. Even animals don't like to watch each other suffer. Exactly, exactly. right. And yet, 
but when we out, you know, when it's not us that's involved in the process of who we help, it becomes moochers versus providers, and yeah. so it's easy to see them as the enemy. That God, what do I care? I, I have my own problems. Why do I have to pay their rent? Absolutely. You know, and until you bring those back together, we're not going to get anywhere. Right. Problem solved. Except, you know, I'm toxic and divisive, and so the messenger should not come from me. Well, well you know, we, we, we talk about voice. that, yeah. and it, I'm sure it's like this in other local governments, too, but I've, I've run for county office two years ago. I ran for county office, and I've gotten to know those people, and I respect them, and they all have good intentions. But in Indiana, their hands are tied unbelievably. The oversight the, and the, the, the process they have to fill out, the bureaucratic the, the state, demands. The state government, it, it all runs downhill. It's just like that classic management, that all the birds on a, on a pole where you've got the boss and all the birds crap on the bird below. That's mm-hmm. what happens in government. So the federal government tells the state government what you have to do. And our state government has been controlled by Republicans in Indiana for 12 years now, or 11 years, whatever it is. And they, they consistently try to cut taxes and do whatever they can to claim victory and claim tax cutting and claim to run for higher office so that they can run for higher office and they can leave with the you know leave with a, a, a John Kasich I cut taxes more than anybody else yada 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 what they do though is they don't cut services they don't do any of the you know, austerity measures you need to do yep. they simply cut, say oh the state's not responsible for it anymore and they pass it off to the next level of government below yeah they offer an unfunded mandate they bitch about all the time from the federal government yep. and they and do, they it do it to the community. counties or the townships mm-hmm. and i i'm telling you I, I didn't get the chance to drive greg around but if i take you on a county road in henry county indiana you will lose a car I, the, the, i'm the, shocked that is, keeps coming up is, because like to me that doesn't make sense even though you know like broad I, ripple has you know it's yugoslavia minutes. i am going to take you we're right. we going to go on a road trip and you will just you will not i i it's gonna. We're gonna film it. It's gonna be. We are libertarians. Video, and you're. We're gonna get out, and you're gonna idea. stand in a pothole. Rex with a GoPro, knees. and it's shaking like crazy, going over the roads. It, it is brutal, and, yeah. I, and, and it, we we have this conversation on the sidebar all the time. And you, you know, Ripper is the big deal, and it's about gay marriage. I tell you what, if you drive one of the 800 miles of county roads in Henry County, you will think you have gone. We have better roads we paved in Iraq more recently than we have in Henry County, Indiana. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's way brutal. cheaper to do it here. Yeah, and, and and they have no money. The the, the, yeah. the locals have to debate on whether or not they're going to add a twenty five dollar wheel tax because that's the only function they have, and the legislature gave them that option. And no year. Republican will touch it because then they can't go any further up. No, they're going to do it. They're going they're going to go ahead and do it, and they're going to get bitched at by their constituents, well, yeah. and they have no choice. Yeah, but it's 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 legitimately not their fault. They're given a gun, put and it's put to their head, and they say, okay, you have to pull the trigger on yourself. Yep. Right. And if you don't do it, you didn't tell the party line, and you're never yeah. going anywhere. We gave you this tool, and you guys didn't. So next time you need something, don't come to me. I served on the Help America Vote Act Commission here in Indiana, and the federal government gave us two million dollars to spend on, like, we could fund three items, but we had eight items that were exceedingly necessary to spend money on. But there wasn't any budget. All we had was the two million dollars. the The legislature couldn't come up with more money. And so these other five essential portions of, of elections just didn't go funded. Things that would make our, our elections, because everybody in the commission, libertarian, independent, Democrat, Republican, they all wanted to make the process more transparent. They wanted to make it more open. They wanted to make it more efficient. They wanted to make the services better uh, and more reliable and more accurate in terms of our elections. But... There were many different federal regulations that that supersede or or, set up the terms of how you can even do it. Yep. You know, I think like uh, it's so hard to see a path forward. It is like you know, but like we were talking about this governor's race. Um, You know, the dynamics of it. uh, You know, uh, Mike Pence is a political heavyweight. He was a national player, rock star with a meteoric career, kind of out of nowhere. And then the third, high, third highest ranking Republican in the House. And then he gets into a governing, you know, where he has to actually make decisions rather than go on Sunday shows and talk about how dumb Democrats are. And, you know, he was ill fit to it. And so we're in an election where it was close last time. The same guy that got close, that scared everybody, is now running again. Pence is running on a message of conservatism, which is looking back at nostalgia. It's organizing a group of white voters with gray hair. Dream, you know, they, they think about when America was great and want to make, I mean, it is. They want to make it great again like it was in the 1950s when they were driving around in their hot rods around the, you know, the county courthouse. Right. 
And that's what he's selling, and that's what a lot of Republicans sell, even their presumptive nominee. Democrats, Hillary at the national level has no vision forward. And anyone that thinks make America decent or fair again is the biggest marketing moron I've ever seen and shows me that all the marketing minds were in the Obama administration. Yeah. Because she has no message forward. It's her entire, you know, it's the same dynamic here. Her campaign is based off Mm anti-Trump. She has no plan. John Gregg here has no plan. That leaves the biggest opening in the world in any political race for a libertarian where the same dynamic exists to say this is where we're going because this is where the world's going and we need to stop clinging to the things that clearly no longer work. Right. Skate to where the puck is going. Mm -hmm. You don't have to create a new system for a vision forward. You have to say, listen, decentralization, look at the world. Bitcoin, you know, where a global world operates in real time, there's very few systems from the past that apply and function well in today's digitized world, an atomized world. And so that's the, you know, that's where a libertarian can create the vision for the future by saying we have to give the power back to the people closest to it because trying to control it has created Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton mm-hmm. or Mike Pence and, and John Gray. Yeah, who's really just, you know, Diet Pence. Really? I mean... It's a, it's a weird it's a weird thing for libertarians though because we don't like to look into the future and give a solution. We haven't had to yet. We've had a much easier time. Like Ron Paul was the worst messenger in the world from that perspective, and Rand is too because they never say when I'm president or this is what it will look like. Right. They say, well, God, Rick Santorum's not a conservative. Nobody yeah. nobody gave more Medicare Part B giveaways than that guy. And right. you like it scores points with us, but it doesn't give anyone else a reason to vote it's for him. It's not the optimism. Talks about right. forward looking, yeah. forward looking candidate. It feels good, like ha, ah, you got the you know the sound bite. Somebody's somebody. preaching to me. Yeah, Some... at least we landed a sound bite finally. Right. Somebody's been saying exactly what I've been saying for forty years. <laughs> In like, the Fed. And that's why when I listen to a lot of other libertarian podcasts, I'm just like, oh, no wonder we're growing because I like, I hear them like, well, if they had taken our advice on the on foreign policy forty years ago, we wouldn't be in this position. It's like, yeah, but you you've just been. <laughs> 15 minutes talking about how you've been vindicated by America losing. And if frogs had wings, they wouldn't bump their ass. Right. Like you can't go and look back and give yourself a pat on the back while you're still losing. You have to start right. from where you're at today. You do. and that's Because the, the American electorate doesn't care. No. You, you, could spend, you can spend about a sentence saying, hey, by the way, we were right four years ago. But then you better move on to what's happening next. I know. It, we are the least qualified to do this. What do you... I mean, come on, scholars. But nope. scholars are never the people that can. It's Donald. Donald Trump's no scholar. He has white papers. Like no economic, kidding. But he is. I mean, he is a smart guy because he figured out how to hack the media for two billion dollars by being outrageous. Right. You know that that helped. We we can't be afraid to learn from that. So we don't have the resources, but if we create controversy, we can seize the moment. So uh, this has been a discussion at work. So I work for a major radio comedy show. Okay, uh, it's the Bob and Tom Show. It's a nationally syndicated radio show. Its foundation is comedy. Uh, it's think of SNL for radio, okay? It's less libertarian wall. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, no politics, we're libertarians. Uh, you can get a free podcast, check it out. Uh, that'd really help me out. Um, but. <laughs> Sorry, I was just added to a secret group on Facebook. Oh, That's uh, always how fun, many, isn't it? How okay. many secret groups are libertarians going to create? How many. I just start to wonder how many I'm not in yet. I'm I'm aborting every, if I'm gonna run as the strong chair. <laughs> mark my words, five point plan, messaging, no opinions until they're earned. Get in line. <laughs> like it literally like how many secret how many message groups can you and I be in together, Greg? I don't I honestly like I, it's so overwhelming at this point, I don't look at any of them. I got, it's like I was saying, I just have quit adding anything to the calendar and then wait for a panic call. Uh, I got uh, I just keep getting added to these message groups and I'm like I I sit down at the end of the day or whenever I have five minutes and I'll check them but it's it's just exhausting Um, it's hard being thoughtful and it's hard being leaders Greg it really is isn't it I you don't get a self anoint it's just hard (laughs) being the smartest smartest libertarians in this apartment now that is us being very libertarian oh yeah (laughs) So <laughs> announcing so, our intelligence to everyone else in the room. So my point is, yes, I know it's been an hour and a half. Calm I, down. A uh, bit. We were, I'm just trying to make sure that you know that you. I know you don't go in as early as you used to. No, no, no I know. Oh, to yeah. bed. That's yeah. why. That's why I put that big clock back there, so that that way I know what time it is. Um, but I don't have the time anxiety now that I go to work for a morning radio show, which does comedy. 
And so we were at lunch today talking about various characters because characters call in. One of them is Donnie Baker. He's hilarious. You want to buy a boat? Yeah, we have uh, Captain Dave. Hilarious. Bill Clinton, quote unquote, calls in. Hilarious. And we have a Donald Trump character that That's calls in. That's not really Bill Clinton. No. Um, Steve Salgi is a great voice actor. I've thought about having him out to maybe a live show or That'd something. That'd be awesome. That'd be yeah, great. to do Bill and, and Trump and Bernie. Um, he does great impersonations. But uh, so we talked about the Trump character. And the guy who was in, real smart radio guy, real big wig, goes, Yeah, I like the Trump thing, but like your guy doesn't say anything more outrageous than Trump. Like, well, yeah. if you're going to do that character, like, because the point of comedy in that. And that vein push, push the button is to push the button, beyond. right? To make it novel, to, to to make a neural connection that has never been made before, or by pushing the boundaries of being outrageous. And so, when your guy and your comedy writers can't think of something more outrageous than the guy is saying, than eating a taco bowl, right? Like you can't. <laughs> and no can one could get noticed at all the entire time. Everyone was talking about it and couldn't stop themselves. So there's a huge problem in comedy. It's not just us. It is literally there was somebody who wrote about it in like the New Yorker or the New York Times or whatever about how comedians Trump is so one note from a comedy perspective. Sort of like Obama. Like, what could you make fun of Obama for? He was just sort of... Uh, <laughs> right. Boring. Yeah, it was a speech pattern thing and, like, right. tempo more than anything. But Bush had, had mannerisms that you could take it and make it ridiculous, and that was funny. Like, think Will Ferrell uh, yep. doing Bush. It was very funny, and he made fun of himself. With Trump, he's so above what people can think of in terms of ridiculousness that comedy writers can't make fun of him. You entered your speech to declare for the presidency on an escalator. Right. I mean, it's, he's, he's comedy. He, he, he is thought that it was good. He thought that it was appropriate or didn't think, it, I don't know. It's like, it's like the Rob interview with Trump. It's great performance art. I he don't is, know. He is, he is putting on the greatest performance in the history of American politics. Right. Because he is convincing these people that he is the hope and change for the future by talking about going backward and all, think about it. He's talking about going backward, making it great again by presenting and thinking that's the vision for forward. He, 1950s. He's like a Pat Buchanan protectionist. Yeah. With Ross Perot with, money. With Ross Perot money, and I, I he does have a, a very good sense. Like in the room, he reacts instantaneously. Mm -hmm. He like with the media thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, we love the press. I love it. Like he he just reads a room. And but it's it's going to see art. It isn't going to see a politician. Yeah. That's why Hillary gets eighty, and he had three thousand. Right, because it's a show. It was a comedy. It he was is, a comedy. show. It's the greatest show in American politics. Yeah, right now. it really was. I mean, it was like going to see a comedy show. Uh, okay, so we got to wrap up. Uh, enough about Trump. I have a feeling we're going to, we're going to talk a lot about Trump. So you, Greg. What are you going to do? Are you going to vote your principles? Are you going to vote for a thir third party now that you're a libertarian? Are you going to vote for Trump? Uh, choose your words carefully. What are you going to do? Why Why would I have to choose my words carefully? We have ways of persuading you to do vote you libertarian now? now. Do you now? Oh, no. This is a point of contention. <laughs> there are repercussions if you don't do the right thing. There are consequences. There are, there are consequences. I believe in self-ownership. I don't really care how you're voting. I just wanted to bring that up. I know you did. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's 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 wrap up. Final thoughts. Uh, shameless self-promotion. Anything you missed, anything you want to talk about, the floor is yours, young Jeremiah. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. The uh, Once again, we were victorious in the Rex Bell campaign, so if anybody will that uh, that's interested and has been following along with this from across the country, um, we are libertarians in the vast broadcast network. Who built that Check. site and what, what, what was used? Hmm. Doesn't matter. If you'll jump on re electrexbell.com and, and, and throw us a little bit of money there, we would appreciate it. We'll put it to good use. Got a lot of uh, a lot of signs, a lot of uh, marketing materials, a lot of Facebook ads to put out there. And uh, if you guys have taken a liking to that campaign and, and been following us along the way, give us a like on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash electrexbell and jump on there and give us 20 or 30 bucks and it will be uh, well received and spent properly. Go to uh, stinkyshorts.com stinky to pick up uh, Rex's book. It's a collection of all of his short stories. It's a libertarian uh, parables. Exactly. It's right. very easy to read. It's probably, in a, unlike anything that a, a, a 
a bona fide libertarian writes in a, in a four-point font. Rex wrote in about a 16-point font. Very easy to read. You can read it yourself, pass it on to your friends. He's probably, I, I couldn't even begin to imagine how many copies oh, he sold, God. but I bet every copy he sells from past around five or six He's, he's in his third printing, but if you go to wearelibertarians.com and you go to authors and it drops down or you go to articles and it drop down, you can choose Rex Bell. We've got 600 uh, columns by Rex yep. at wearelibertarians.com. So that's the, uh, that's the political side. The personal side, it is May in Indianapolis. I enjoy listening to uh, to the AM radio here. You drive around town. There's an hour long talk radio just on indie cars, and then after that, there's the talk of gasoline in the alley with Donald Davidson. If you like the nerd nerdity of We Are Libertarians, jump on, look up Donald Davidson, and just listen to the history of the Indianapolis. It's Florida Trump Speedway. voter wall, basically. It, it basically uh, Sam Goldstein, Brett Bittner, Nick Sarwark, and yeah, and you. Went out to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway the day after the convention, and yep. Sam was like, I, I, he, "He's like a tour guide. He goes to oh. every car and he has the whole story. And he knows more than the actual, you know, yeah. paid historian." It was it was fun. We took we took Nick around the speedway, and uh, we I, I I sent him a little bit of money in his. Uh, I gave Mark money too, but uh, I sent, oh. <laughs> I sent a little bit of money next way uh, for his campaign, and said, "Hey, I'll, know, I'll be watching the cars." Um, on, on during Memorial Day, and he told me to enjoy the races. But yeah, we, uh, I, so it was. Peterson asked if we were coming out, and they go, "No, I got the 500." He's like, "Ah, it's only the future of the country at stake." I was like, "Yeah, it's not." I'll that. I'll tell you what, it's outreach for me. I was pat last year at the 500. I was passing out Libertarian Party of Indiana koozies yeah. in turn three. That's where you it's should. It's an do outreach it. event. It's fun. Yeah. There's people there. Yeah, absolutely. There we are, should go where the people. <laughs> are. It is the largest single day sporting event in 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 the United States. There will be over 300,000 people. There are 260,000 seats that are sold. There will be 50 to 70,000 people in the infield. It and is they a are great huge Americans. Crowd. And it is going to be a libertarian crowd in turn three this follow, year. Follow Jer and I. I think Twitter. there's going to be a lot Absolutely. of Trump shirts. Follow me yeah. on Twitter, facebook.com slash Jeremiah. Donald Moore. might be the, per, the... I may wear my hat. You will get so many high fives. Oh my God, I'm, I'm going to wear the hat. He's, He's going to have 260,000 voters on the same He's place. He's going to wear a Tony Kanan shirt because it looks a little Mexican and a Donald Trump hat. I am praying that my dad actually will take me, but uh, Sharon never wants to go, so I usually get to go. All right, Greg Lenz. Uh, let's see, anything. One, thanks, Jeremiah, for coming. Appreciate it. I always, I always love it when Jeremiah is on. He likes to troll you as much as I do. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Apparently, <laughs> that's not a shared sentiment. <laughs> Did you catch that? Yeah, it's fine. In, in spite of, uh, in spite of uh, our friendship, uh, we do get to come on once in a while. Outreach, quote unquote. Yeah, we have, we'd like to make him feel good. I no. self invite. I pay my way onto here. I send a check every month. And every so often I'm allowed through the door. <laughs> Apparently. Um, but no, congratulations because you did a wonderful job running Rex's um, primary, or well, it's not technically a primary, but winning and getting him the nomination. I have full faith in you, and I think you guys will make an impact and do well. If it was anyone else running a campaign, I would probably not. But I have full faith in Jeremiah Moore <laughs> running a real political campaign. Um, yeah, it'll be all right. <laughs> The inspirational character that is Chris Bangle today. You know, he doesn't get a survivor celebrity to work from, you know. Yeah. Like, he had a, you know. <laughs> I'm the, working with Rex Bell and Stinky Wilmot, okay? And, and Rex, is the, man. Rex is the man, but and Rex excited. didn't go on Survivor. No, but maybe for the reelect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's not a bad idea, really. Um, but yeah, so congratulations. And then, is there anything coming? Uh... I don't think there's anything. We got the live show. Yep. Um, May then, 23rd. May 23rd. I'm going to be at the... I'll be at the National Convention for a couple days. You're going to oh, make yeah. it. Cool. Really? How, how are you persuaded? How was I persuaded? Yeah, how were you persuaded to make the National Convention? I felt like the LP has a chance to stand out on a major stage. Are you going to be a delegate? And no, are you going to be no, a I'm not going delegate? to any of the crap. I'm not going to go talk about time zones and bylaws. Yeah. Like I'd rather kill you don't myself. want to vote for Johnson or Peterson and be the no I, to make I, the decision. I I support Gary Johnson. He is my he on paper. I would vote for him and I would just shout him from a mountaintop. And then I see him in person. I'm like, oh my god, I can't even introduce him to people. And like I know that's bad, right? But that's the way I feel. And I want you know I'd much rather introduce Austin Peterson to liberty friendly Republicans and personal friends who are still learning about libertarianism because they'd be like, man, this guy inspires me. Then Gary, talking about I build his house from his hands, which so, is a great accomplishment, but it's it doesn't sell to me. I want someone proud. 
So let's get back to your trip to Orlando. So are you, you going to uh, go get your own room? I thought I could keep going. Are you going to get your own room or are you going to share a room? That's good. At, that's economical. You're going to like go Sea World. And I don't know what you guys are implying. Are you going to Disney World? Oh, well, we're just asking. We're being friends. Are you? Yeah. That doesn't sound at all. Like, and look, I just gave you these great compliments, and you son of a. <laughs> 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 now you're look over there with the Canadian. You know, the funny joke is that Spangle is... I was born two miles from Canada. I know. And yet, Spangle is the, the resident Canadian here. So there's a podcast that I love called The Mike O'Meara Show. And uh, listen, if you if you hear anything in radio, you're hearing it because that person stole it. And so they have a joke on there about Canada invading America. And I thought, well, that's, kind of, that's pretty funny. And that would be a good way to kind of illustrate the ridiculousness of nationalism and our foreign policy by making Canada a threat. Because what happens if, you know, 98% of Canadians live on the border, they're plotting, they send Michael J. Fox over here to, to scout, Alan Thicke comes down and, and starts diagramming Shania cities. Twain starts singing the national right. anthem. Right. And then Bieber, though? Bieber? That was a pretty good troll. Yeah, they, they really got us good with that. But then, you know, so they're re- they're playing, planning an invasion, and then what if Canadians occupy Indianapolis? And so somehow, someone, I think it was Troy Hill... Somewhere in 2012, 2013. Early on, because I still didn't get the inside joke. Yeah, I was new. Turned it into me being Canadian, and eh? and it is really, a Mountie. It just I finally had to just say to everyone, it's not funny anymore. Which you, made it way more funny you for us. Beaten that horse deader than the Mean Boys. Chris uh, Maple Leaf Spangle. Oh, uh, so yeah. It, so neither of you are going to be down there. No, I'm going to be no. in turn Seriously? three, the Indy 500. Dead serious. If the Libertarian Party. Would quit hosting these these conventions during Memorial Day weekend. I would attend more of the conventions. They are. They're, this is the, the last next. Year. The next one is going to be Fourth of July in New Orleans, uh, in, New Orleans in 2018 or whatnot. And I'll be there. Yeah. And we'll have okay. a hell of a time. All right. I really you can did bring think... your date. You can bring your date, and I'll find one too. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Listen, if you are a young Liberty lady ready to spread your uh, seed <laughs> of liberties, then uh, we have a man for you, Jeremiah Morrill. You've heard his voice. That's right. He's an honorable young man. He's got. A, he's got many. He's got many. I'm quite the catch. We've He's got, got many square feet, we've plus... Got, we've got a swimming pool, a bass pad. boat. Okay. It, Listen, he's by, got... By, by, by November, we'll have a pool liner. He's Somehow got you managed to sink a pool. Yeah. He's got three living rooms and four TVs. <laughs> no, five. Five TVs. Five TVs. It's, it's, it's two garages. It's two garages. I it, the the list is uh, just it's send your right. applications. Find me on Facebook. No. Send me a message. Greg's taken. Spangles taken. We, but I'm still out there. Greg, yeah. We well, listen. We don't. <laughs> Need applications. <laughs> we need... That was cool. That was further than I was going to uh, That was brutal. I know it was. Listen, I got... I'm a, voting for Pence. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I don't need applications. I just need photos. Send them to uh, spangle at wearelibertarians.com. I will weed them out for Jeremiah. Was that shallow? I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I, I, th- I don't think uh, your girlfriend might have some content with you being... The vetting process for he's women. my wingman. I, uh, my everybody's sweet, gonna be Chris Spangle approved. My sweet girlfriend, she's. Uh, I won't get into it. I'll get in trouble. She's. Yeah. She's, we yeah. don't want to get anybody in any trouble tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't have anything other than show up May twenty third or else. All right. Thank you for joining us here in this episode of We Are Libertarians. Thanks to Greg. Thanks for Jer- to Jeremiah. Thanks for bringing the pizza. Oh wait. Oh well. Now this is awkward. Thanks for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians, and as always, we promise to do better next time. Tight episode. Very good. All right, hold on. Let me record something. Can we stop this? Yes, please.